Recalling her first meeting with Mark DeLillo in her past life, and then her final fateful meeting with him, when he ran her over, Olivia's heart filled with anguish. Hatred tightened her entire body, and her hands instinctively clenched into fists, nails digging into the table. What's wrong? Jeremy immediately sent something amiss with Olivia. Olivia spread her hands on the table and regained her composure. It's nothing. Jeremy glanced at the marks left by Olivia's nails on the table, unconvinced that she was fine, but he chose not to press the issue. Looking at Pamela, who was eager to try her luck, Olivia's gaze turned cold and determined. I'm going to kill you, Olivia thought. I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to kill Mark, and I'm never going to let the two of you team up against me ever again. Now for the other piece of great news, Adam smiled, retrieving an envelope from his pocket, unaware of the simmering rage living inside Olivia. Take a look at this. What's that? The students focused their attention on the envelope in Adam's hand. This is the prize money awarded to me by the school, Adam revealed. You guys sold the most photos of any class in the charity photo competition, so the school wanted to give you a little reward. So before you take your final exams next week, I thought maybe you guys could all go enjoy group dinner tonight after school as a way to bond as a class. Show some school spirit. Oh, good idea. Should we hit up the dock grill? It's this great place by the water, Sam said. My parents' friends own it, so they could probably seat all of us out on the patio. The other students all clapped in confirmation and excitement. Olivia shook her head. The dock grill was an upscale restaurant, but of course, the students here would want to go there. People at Marshall High had expensive taste, no matter how old they were. Adam, you should come too and bring your partner, the students playfully taunted. Yes, bring your girlfriend. No, she's busy, Adam smiled and replied. All right, pack up your things and get out of here. Go enjoy your weekends before final and study hard after you relax tonight, okay? But take the night off, you deserve it. Amidst the students' chatter, the school bell rang. Everyone grabbed their bags and bid farewell to each other before leaving the classroom. As Millie, Wendy, and Olivia made their way to the dock grill to meet their classmates, they laughed and joked with each other the entire way. When they arrived, Sam Feinstein was already there, and after exchanging greetings, Sam put in an order for appetizers to greet the juniors as they trickled in. Soon, their other classmates started to arrive one after another. They had reserved the largest private section, which featured a bunch of round tables out on the patio. The students naturally separated into groups, occupying the respective tables. As the dishes were about to be served, Olivia asked, Has everyone arrived? Is anyone missing? The classmates exchanged glances and realized that two people were yet to show up. Jeremy and um, Pamela haven't arrived yet, someone mentioned. Call them and find out where they are, Olivia frowned. Francis dialed Jeremy's number and relayed the information. Jeremy says he's on his way. He'll be here soon. Another student said, Pamela mentioned that she's feeling unwell and won't be coming. Oh, Olivia replied in a cool tone. In her previous life, there was also a class gathering like this around the holidays, and back then, Pamela, the class president, had organized it successfully, and everyone, except for Olivia, had a great time. After all the dishes were served, Jeremy finally arrived. As everyone began chatting and laughing, the atmosphere became lively. It was their first official class gathering outside of school, where nearly everyone was in attendance. And although there were various cliques present, the ambiance remained cheerful. Laughter filled the air as they enjoyed their meal. Observing everyone's joy, both Sam Feinstein and Olivia felt a sense of pride in their class. After eating, the group still felt like hanging out and decided to continue the celebration elsewhere. They discussed whether to go sing karaoke, and while some students expressed their unavailability due to prior commitments, the rest agreed to go to a nearby all-ages restaurant and bar that had private karaoke rooms. It was still earlier in the evening, 
making it easy to find a spacious karaoke room. The remaining juniors ordered popcorn, drinks, and other treats, and then followed the waiter to their designated private karaoke room. At that moment, someone suddenly stopped and pointed toward a figure exiting a private room, exclaiming, Hey, isn't that Pamela? All eyes turned in her direction, and indeed they saw Pamela strolling along, oblivious to their presence. She engaged in animated conversation with another girl wearing a new Gucci coat, heading towards the restroom. Obviously, she's chatting up someone she thinks is rich, Olivia thought, probably hanging on that girl's every word so she can use her status to try to climb up in the world. Olivia wondered if Pamela had made friends with someone outside of school to try to ride their coattails since she was clearly unsuccessful riding Olivia's thus far. Uh, I thought she wasn't feeling well. Wendy's voice trailed off, astonishment evident. The others remained silent, feeling a certain awkwardness settling over the gathering. Forget her. Let's focus on our own fun. Olivia waved her hand dismissively. Go to the left. That's the spacious room we reserved. Yes, the others nodded in agreement. While they didn't voice their thoughts, they were all wondering why Pamela was there. Yet despite their initially dampened spirits, a wave of energy washed over them as they entered their private karaoke room. Wendy stepped forward and took charge, belting out a popular pop song with a surprisingly impressive vocal range. Her infectious enthusiasm spread like wildfire, prompting others to join in. The room reverberated with laughter, camaraderie, and heartfelt singing as they took turns showcasing their hidden talents. Amidst the lively atmosphere, Olivia found herself immersed in the joyful ambiance. She couldn't help but tap her feet to the rhythm, feeling the beat pulsating through her veins. With a platter of yummy candy by her side and a refreshing soft drink in her hand, she reveled in the moment, her voice blending harmoniously with the others. Nobody cared if they were off tune. The karaoke room became a haven of exuberance, with each performance infused with a unique flair and an undeniable sense of fun. They laughed, they danced, and they sang their hearts out, creating cherished memories that would be etched in their minds for years to come. Liv, Wendy leaned her arm against Olivia's, we're planning to go shopping later, after karaoke on Broadway. All the stores are open late because the holidays are approaching, and everyone wants to hang out before we have to start really studying for finals tomorrow. Count me in, Olivia nodded. She too desired a leisurely outing. If luck was on her side, she might stumble upon a valuable limited edition bag while out shopping that she could buy as an investment. All right. Wendy made an okay gesture. Millie, Jeremy, and Francis are coming too. Wendy smirked. I also called Chris. Wendy blinked mischievously. Wendy, how do you have Chris's number? At school, he was complaining about how elusive you are. So I told him that if he couldn't find you, he could contact me instead, and we swapped numbers. Olivia's mouth twitched at the corner. You truly are something, aren't you? Of course, <laughs> Wendy chuckled. Olivia stood up. Where are you going? Wendy asked. The restroom, Olivia replied, leaving the room. She turned a corner and unexpectedly bumped into Pamela. Pamela seemed to have come out of another private karaoke room to answer a phone call or something. Olivia? Pamela was equally taken aback when she saw Olivia. She instinctively glanced around, worried that someone else might have seen her at the karaoke bar, making the situation rather awkward. What a coincidence, Olivia chuckled mockingly. Uh, yeah. Pamela smiled guiltily. Are you alone? In the hallway right now? Yes, Olivia asked, amusement evident in her voice. Pamela felt a pang of guilt, finding herself in the presence of the person she least wanted to encounter. Well, um, I, that I can honestly say that I was feeling unwell earlier, so I decided not to go to the class dinner. You weren't feeling well, so you came to sing karaoke? Olivia mockingly laughed. Well, you see, this manager here is my mom's friend, I came to deliver something for her. Pamela smiled, attempting to cover her tracks. I'm leaving now. With that, she rubbed her temples. It's too noisy here. 
I still have a headache. Olivia remained silent, refraining from commenting on Pamela's obvious lie. Even if I couldn't read your thoughts, I'd be able to see right through this one, she thought. She simply watched as Pamela looked at her. Even though she knew the truth, Olivia chose not to expose it. However, the ridicule in her eyes became more apparent with each passing moment. Pamela felt her words falter, and a tremor passed through her body as she stared at Olivia's eyes, filled with suspicion and distrust. After a long pause, she uttered, You... you wouldn't make baseless accusations about me not really being sick, would you? Why would I say something baseless? Olivia responded, throwing the question back at her. Olivia thought about how they were alone like this, with no one else in the dark hallway, and loud music blaring all around them. Nobody would hear if Pamela suddenly screamed or fell to the floor with a loud thud, would they? Now might be my perfect opportunity, Olivia thought. I could kill you now. I could do away with you before you even have the opportunity to hurt me further or meet Mark Dillolo and ruin my life. Olivia's eyes narrowed, and a sinister smile spread across her lips. Unaware of what Olivia was thinking, Pamela bit her lip. Don't you dare mention that you saw me here. Do you hear me? She threatened. At that moment, two adults who were in another private karaoke room exited their room and brushed past the girls on the way to the bathroom. Damn it, Olivia thought, wishing she'd taken her chance. Maybe if I can get Pamela talking a bit more, I can find another chance in here when I'm sure we're alone. Olivia smiled and replied, Why shouldn't I tell people I saw you here? You. Pamela ground her teeth. What do you want? Well, if you wanted to give me some money, maybe I could keep quiet. When my pockets are full, I tend to forget everything. It's the weirdest thing. Olivia leaned casually against the nearby wall deliberately exposing the pockets of her pants for Pamela to see. Are you... you're blackmailing me? Pamela hesitated for a moment. This Olivia had no shame. She didn't need money, so why was she doing this? Just to make Pamela uncomfortable? Yes, Olivia thought. I love to watch you squirm. My time is valuable, so you better make it quick. Olivia's smile widened. Pamela gritted her teeth and then pulled out $500 from her wallet and stuffed it into Olivia's pocket. Now don't say anything. I don't want our whole class to think I flaked and lied to them. I really am sick, she insisted, then turned to leave. Uh? Olivia pretended to ponder and teased. I bumped into someone at the karaoke place today. Who was it? Who was it? Why can't I remember? Don't push it. Pamela saw Olivia's expression and couldn't help but grow angry. What exactly do you want? I don't consider my pockets full yet. Olivia teased Pamela with a mischievous look. In her previous life, she had gifted Pamela numerous limited edition bags, makeup, and clothing. Perhaps it was time to collect some interest. Yeah, Olivia thought, you owe me way more. Biting her lower lip again, Pamela trembled with anger. She pulled out another $500 from her wallet and shoved it into Olivia's pocket. That's it. If you dare to use this against me again, I'm going to make you miserable. All right, this time I won't remember I saw you here. Olivia laughed. I promise. It was too much fun making Pamela angry. <laughs> Pamela coldly snorted and turned to leave. Olivia watched as Pamela's shoulders trembled with anger before turning and walking toward the bathroom, a broad smile adorning her face. Pamela clenched her fist tightly. Could Olivia be any more despicable? She had truly revealed her true nature. At school, she presented herself as a good girl who was morally righteous, and at banquets and social events, she acted like a proper young lady. But now, with no one around, she had finally revealed her true self. She's the absolute worst, Pamela thought. She's the devil reincarnate. Olivia grimaced when she heard Pamela think this, and she concentrated on Pamela's back. Now you're going to wish you hadn't said that, Olivia thought, and she pulled her hands up, 
preparing to sweep Pamela off the ground with her mind and send her crashing down the stairs that were just around the corner. She would make it look like an accident, like poor Pamela hadn't been feeling well after all and had a dizzy spell that resulted in her tumbling down the stairs. Wow, someone said over Olivia's shoulders just as she raised her arms up. You trying to put a hex on her or something? What? Olivia said, spinning around to see who was behind her. Huh? A person who had been lurking in the shadow suddenly emerged. The corners of his mouth curled up. He had originally intended to head to the bathroom, but unexpectedly witnessed such an interesting scene, so he stopped to watch it unfold. Jeremy? Olivia asked. What are you? He casually strolled towards the bathroom. Had to use the little boy's room. What were you doing? Looked like you were trying to do a little magic spell on her or something. The way you're waving your hands around. You know, some sort of wizardy Harry Potter, he teased. Olivia tried to laugh it off so she didn't arouse suspicion. Funny. No, I was just... <laughs> I was just about to flip her off. She looked down. It's probably good you stopped me. I don't like losing my cool like that. She could see that Jeremy had seen the entire exchange where she blackmailed Pamela, so she inhaled deeply. Pamela owes me, she tried to explain. I've kept a lot of her secrets and I know a lot about her. When Jeremy said nothing, she said, It's complicated. Jeremy looked at her, his mind blank so she couldn't read it. Hey, no judgment, he said finally. He passed her and slipped into the bathroom. That was close, Olivia thought. Way, way, way too close. Olivia's heart was racing so much in her temples that she couldn't read Jeremy's thoughts through the wall even if she tried at this point. She had almost been caught using her powers. But, she reassured herself, he didn't see me. I'm okay. Even if he thought I was being bitchy or rude or even really, really weird, he didn't see me do anything I can't take back. So we're okay. She tried to calm herself down and return to the karaoke room before she had to have another awkward moment with Jeremy. She felt too seen by him, like maybe he was suspicious of her. So she re-entered the room where all her friends were. Everyone continued singing in the karaoke until nearly 8 o'clock. When they settled the bill and realized they had spent way more than expected, Olivia used Pamela's money to pay the remaining balance. Olivia smiled. Merry Christmas, everyone. Enjoy your Christmas. Her classmates nodded and thanked her. Across the street, as the students left the karaoke restaurant and bar, Pamela watched from inside a cafe. She didn't want anyone else to see her on the street making her way home, so she stayed here until she knew they were all gone. That bitch. Pamela simmered while watching Olivia and clenching her fist tightly. Olivia had stooped to such despicable lows. It's all right, she tried to soothe herself. As long as I do well on my final exams and rank amongst the top of my class so I can compete in my school's elite student competition, everything else will fall into place. As Olivia and her friends continued shopping, unaware of Jeremy's suspicions, Francis grabbed everyone's attention. Hey guys! He said excitedly. I just got a text from my dad saying our family's company is having a big 100th anniversary celebration on New Year's Eve because next year will be its 100th year in business. He said I can invite as many friends as I want. So if you guys don't have any plans for New Year's Eve, are you interested in coming? I don't have any plans yet, Olivia nodded. So I'll come as long as your mom isn't quite so enthusiastic about me as she was the last time I met her. Olivia joked. She was a little afraid of Francis' mother ever since she came on so strongly at the Thanksgiving event at school. Don't worry, I'll talk to her. Francis smiled awkwardly. I'll come with Liv, Chris smiled. It seemed he needed to look after his fiance. I'll try to make it. Millie was still a little hesitant. I'll be there. Wendy looked very interested. She had never participated in a big company party before, and she didn't have any plans yet. Jeremy, how about you? Francis asked. Jeremy shook his head. I have family stuff that night. He did not want to go anywhere that might expose his real identity. Nobody here knew who he really was yet. All right. 
Knowing how shy Jeremy was, Francis didn't press the matter anymore. After leaving Chanel and then strolling through Balenciaga, the group walked back out onto the street, shopping bags in hand. Where else? Millie asked. Let's go and take a look over there. Olivia pointed at an upscale department store. When the group entered, they found that most of the other people shopping inside were couples. They held hands or put their arms around each other's shoulders. They smiled sweetly, chatted, and occasionally kissed their foreheads or cheeks. Olivia busied herself looking at makeup and did not pay attention to the surroundings. Chris and Jeremy, on the other hand, felt a little awkward. When they passed by a brooch placed in a square rotating glass window, Olivia stopped in her tracks. Could you please show me this brooch? Okay. The clerk used a small key to open the glass lock and then put on a white glove to take out the brooch and place it flat on a sapphire blue velvet cushion on the counter. Olivia picked up the brooch. It was about the size of a pentagon coin. It was an exquisite crown with a platinum edge. There were three colored round crystals of different sizes in the hollow inside. In the middle was a diamond with two carats. It reflected a beautiful light under the light and looked very beautiful. How much is this? Well, this brooch is a new seasonal work by the designer of Paris, Palsy Moscow. Under the bright light of the display cabinet, the jeweler reflected a beautiful light, making Olivia's tongue twitch. The clerk showed her the brooch's six-digit price tag. Olivia admired the piece quietly. Her monthly allowance was not enough to buy such expensive jewelry. The tiny brooch was priced at nearly $120,000. Chris noticed her gaze and asked, You like it? Oh. Olivia smiled and said, I mean, who wouldn't? She turned her head and looked around. But it's silly how much it is. Shall we go to the next door? Okay. As Olivia made her way away from the display case, Chris and Jeremy turned around at the same time and looked at the delicate brooch again. Each of them had their own ideas, but Millie and Wendy began talking to Olivia, and she was too preoccupied to notice. Instead, she was swept up in the current of people in the department store, and soon, she and her friends were back out on the street. Oh my god, look! Millie said, pointing to a nearby gallery on the corner. Isn't that... Wait, doesn't that look familiar? Olivia walked forward, and the closer she got to the gallery, the more familiar the photographs hanging in the window seemed. One in particular looked very familiar. Uh... Standing behind the crowd, Olivia was speechless. Is this Danny Wilson's photography exhibition? Oh my gosh, yeah! Wendy nodded. His sister Callie said he was going to have an exhibition opening at a gallery in town around the holidays, or in December or something. This must be it, I completely forgot. Jeremy looked at the enlarged photo of Olivia, which had won their school's charity photo competition, and he smiled. He couldn't help it. He was attracted to Olivia in spite of himself. Liv! Wendy turned around and saw Olivia. Seeing Wendy's excited look, Olivia immediately stretched out her finger to make a silent gesture. Shh, shh, don't make a big deal. I don't want to draw attention. Before Olivia could finish her sentence, Wendy pointed at the photo and said, Liv, look, it's you! Hearing Wendy's words, the surrounding crowd also turned to look at Olivia and started to say, Whoa, look, it's the girl from the photo! Olivia didn't like being stared at and talked about like this, so she turned around to leave. Come on, let's get out of here, she muttered to her friends. Liv, what is the matter? Wendy followed and asked. Nothing, Olivia sighed. I'm a little tired. Why don't we go home? Yes, let's, Chris said, swooping in to help Olivia when he could see she was irritated. I've had enough shopping today. I'm not a fan of crowds. Too much people, he smiled. The others nodded, though Francis kept stealing glances back at Olivia's photo hanging in the gallery. It was large and gorgeous. Francis, what are you thinking? Millie asked when she noticed this. Nothing. Francis shook his head, but he was thinking in his heart. It's such a big picture, and if I could hang it on the wall at home, I could admire it whenever I wanted. Everyone dispersed, 
and Olivia was too busy calling Morris Pratt to pick her up, so she didn't hear Francis's thoughts. As soon as her driver pulled around, she settled into the car and took a nap on the way home, tired from her evening of shopping and eating and karaoke, and of almost getting caught trying to harm Pamela. That was a close one, she thought. I gotta be more careful next time. Between that and what happened at the gala, I really need to slow down and plan my moves out more cautiously. As soon as she entered her house, Olivia heard a hearty laugh, and her attention was pulled in the direction of the sofa near the grand foyer. She saw Monica sitting obediently and peeling an orange for Michael. Here you go, Dad. Thank you, Michael responded. Rachel put her hands on her knees and smiled gently, lovingly at her daughter and husband. This is what I've always wanted, Rachel thought. The three of us, and not Olivia, enjoying ourselves like a family, getting along harmoniously. Mommy, I'll peel you an orange too. Monica smiled and quickly peeled an orange and handed it to Rachel with both hands. Rachel had told her to do this before they came downstairs, to show her father how quiet and obedient and easy to get along with she could be. Such a good girl. Rachel smiled and took the orange, unaware that Olivia had entered the house. Michael, our Monica has grown up so much and is maturing into such a lovely young girl, isn't she? Yes, Michael smiled. She has final exams next week. This is an important time in her studies for college applications. Do you want to invite a tutor to the house this week for her? Rachel asked. Isn't she good at studying? Michael asked. Actually, I think a tutor might help. Monica looked at Michael. What kind of tutor do you want? Michael thought about it. He might as well hire a tutor for both of his daughters, since he knew Olivia needed one too. Well, he or she must be Ivy League educated, right? My family background demands it. I don't want regular people to teach me, and it's important the tutor isn't too old. He must have a good personality and can't be old-fashioned. He has patience and... Before Monica could finish her words, Olivia entered the room laughing and interrupted Monica. Monica heard Olivia's laughter, and a trace of disgust flashed across her eyes, but her mouth still politely said, Olivia, you are back? Yep, Olivia replied and walked towards the sofa. Liv, where did you go today and come back so late? Michael looked at the clock. It was almost 10 o'clock. We had a class bonding dinner, Olivia replied. I was eating and singing with my classmates. Then I went Christmas shopping with my friends, since the stores all stay open later in December. Monica looked sour and when she saw the shopping bag in Olivia's hand, she became even more furious. She still hated that Michael gave Olivia an allowance. It was like he was giving away Monica's inheritance to some poor pauper he brought in off the street. What good stuff did you buy? Just some gifts, Olivia said mysteriously. Tell me. Monica had a wronged look on her face, like she needed to know. She wanted so badly to know how much of her family's money Olivia was spending. I'm curious. Monica was about to make a comment about how Olivia spent money that wasn't even hers too frivolously when she heard Rachel clearing her throat to remind her to behave. Monica hurriedly suppressed her anger and said, Liv, I suppose I'm really just concerned about you. You have time to go out and sing and go shopping, but finals are next week and you didn't do so well on your midterms so don't you think you should spend more time on your studies right now? After all, Dad said he's willing to find a tutor for both you and I. You should cherish the fact that you have a dad who cares so much about your well-being and show him you care by focusing on studying. Monica hoped Michael would hear this and be utterly disappointed in Olivia to such an extent that he took away all of Olivia's allowance. Good thinking, Olivia said. I'm gonna go to my room and start studying. She had no intention of studying tonight, but she knew Monica would look bad if she didn't put up a fight and instead just pretended to agree. Good night, Father. Thank you so much for helping us find a tutor. Love you. She turned and walked upstairs. Monica was unwilling to not get the result she expected. Dad, look at Olivia's attitude. She's so flippant, and she's obviously just taunting me. I'm just concerned about her. 
What are you talking about? Monica, she seemed perfectly fine just now. Michael said, You just need to worry about yourself. I... What? Monica was frustrated. Monica just cares about her sister. Rachel chimed in. She felt that Monica spoke a little too much today, though, and hurriedly tried to smooth things over. Very well, Michael responded, slightly exasperated with his youngest daughter, and stood up. I have work to do. I'll be in my office. Daddy, when will I get my tutor? Monica asked in a hurry. I will find one for you soon and for your sister. After Michael answered, he walked upstairs to the study. Rachel's eyes darkened once her husband was gone. Monica, go up to your room and get to bed early. Okay, is everything all right? Yes, just go. Monica did as she was told, unsure what was going on with her mom. Once alone, Rachel's expression became more serious. The more Michael paid attention to Olivia, the more she felt uneasy. But she couldn't do anything right now. She could only wait for the spring to come and wait for her son Chase to return home with Michael's brother Bruno. Only then could she take the next step. I have to take precautions against Olivia, that little Scrooge, Rachel thought. I have to get rid of her. After partying with Olivia and the others in Manhattan's shopping district, Jeremy went to the alley he had agreed upon with his driver and sat on the curb until his family's Bentley arrived to pick him up. How was your excursion with your classmates today, Jeremy? His driver asked. Very good. Jeremy looked outside the window and was in a good mood. You, um... The driver hesitated and wanted to say something, but in the end, he chose to shut his mouth. The car drove quietly through the streets of downtown. The flashing neon lights, the couples snuggling against each other in the cold, all of it passed by Jeremy's steely gaze. His thoughts were still on Olivia. He still couldn't figure out what was going on with her. Once home, Jeremy absentmindedly opened the car door and walked to his home's front entrance. He was still distracted when he entered his family's mansion. But as soon as he did, wham, something hit him in the face. Jeremy frowned and immediately took a step back. Seeing Jeremy retreat, the person who had hit him did not seem to relax at all. After blocking sideways, Jeremy threw a punch at the door, but his mysterious opponent struck him with their palm. Both of them held each other's wrists at the same time. At this moment, the lights of the villa lit up. Jeremy could see the person clearly through the lights and he stood stunned for a moment. Devin? Merry Christmas! The person standing opposite Jeremy waved her hand. Did you miss me? No. Jeremy walked past the woman and entered the room without looking back. That's not very nice, the woman frowned. You weren't like this when you were young. You liked me. Ma'am, you're here, Jeremy's driver said to Devin after entering the house. Albert, long time no see, she replied. How have you been recently? Thanks to you, I am well and everything is fine. Devin nodded and smiled. It's all thanks to you, actually, for taking care of Jeremy. Albert shrugged. It's what I was tasked to do, and I take pride in my job. Devin smiled approvingly. She looked like she was in her early 20s. She was dressed in casual clothes. She had short, dark hair that curled about her ears. The contours of her muscles could be seen from her tight body. She looked tan and healthy and she was wearing a pair of short boots. Devin turned around and walked around the house looking around. You guys are the only ones here? We're the maids and stuff. Due to safety considerations, we didn't invite any permanent maids, but we have people to come and clean on time every day. Albert replied. Oh, that's not bad, I guess. Devin nodded and saw Jeremy pouring water. She walked over and said, Little bro, how are you doing in Manhattan? Did you miss home? Go back home. Jeremy drank a mouthful of water, his expression cold. Jeremy, is this the attitude you should have towards your own sister? Devin was a little unhappy. She put her hands on her hips and scolded him. I don't have time to play with you. 
Jeremy glanced at her and said, Albert, book a plane ticket for her to return home tomorrow. I have to start studying. After saying that, Jeremy walked to his room. The time he wasted today could only be used to work overtime at night. Jeremy, don't be like that. Devin scowled. I'm not leaving. Miss. Albert blushed with shame. Let me show you to your room, where you'll be staying. Actually, why don't you show me the photo you mentioned on the phone first? She was very curious to see it. What kind of girl would that closed-off little brother be interested in? Yes, ma'am, Albert replied. He had called to inform Jeremy's family in San Francisco about a photo of a classmate Jeremy had bought and which he had seemed preoccupied with. Not only that, but Jeremy seemed to watch the girl often after school, a girl named Olivia. He only hoped that Jeremy would forgive him if he ever found out that Albert had shared this information with Devin and the others in his family. Sunday was bright and sunny. Although the cold wind was still blowing, the sunshine was still very pleasant. So although Olivia's original plan was to stay inside and study the whole day, she decided instead to take her dog out. Besides, Polly was acting cute and wanted to play. When she was playing with Polly in a nearby park, she did not notice a black German car parked across the street, nor did she notice that she and Polly were being captured on camera. An arm extended from the window of the back seat of the car and snapped photos of Olivia. Then, putting away the camera, the photographer said to his passenger, I think we found Betty. Are you sure? That husky is Betty. The passenger wasn't convinced. After all, Betty had been lost for a few months, in that amount of time, the appearance of a puppy could change so much. I think so. The photographer fiddled with the camera and looked at the photo. We'll look at her markings of the dog in the photos more closely back home to confirm it. Okay. The person in the passenger seat nodded. I'll arrange for someone to check the background of the girl who took Betty away. The photographer turned off the camera and nodded. After such a long time, they finally found Betty. It felt good. If it's indeed Betty, do you think our boss will come to claim her personally? The man sitting in the front passenger seat was somewhat uncertain about his young boss's unpredictable personality. He should, the photographer said. Betty was our boss's favorite. Otherwise, he wouldn't have put a reward of $5,000 for her the moment she left. He even asked the two of us to stay in Manhattan to continue searching for her after she ran off. Good point. The person sitting in the passenger seat sighed and said, Come on, now that we know where she lives, we can keep an eye on her. The driver responded, Let's go home and compare the markings on this dog with the ones in Betty's puppy pictures more closely. The driver pulled away from the curb, and the car headed in the opposite direction of Olivia walking her dog. Unaware, because the people in the car were too far for her to eavesdrop on, Olivia played with Polly for more than an hour before she brought her home. When they got inside, Olivia threw a tennis ball for Polly to fetch while laying down lazily to catch her breath. Polly cooperated, wagging her tail happily. Rachel and Monica, who were coming down the stairs, happened to see this. Mommy, why is she playing with the dog in the living room? She's going to make a mess. Monica rolled her eyes. When will our dog Candy come back? You know Candy has been sent to Europe for training for her next dog show. Rachel furrowed her brows. Rachel shot a jealous look at Olivia, who was playing with her dog. Don't worry, she assured her daughter. In the long run, we will be happy and Olivia will suffer. And everything that irks you now will just be a distant memory. Olivia, good, you're home, Michael said upon seeing Olivia on the living room couch. I want you to come meet your tutor. What? Olivia was taken aback. Michael had arranged for a tutor so quickly. Are they here now? She wondered what kind of person it was. Yes, Michael nodded. You didn't give me any guidelines, so it was easier to find yours than Monica's. He said, come, I'll introduce you. Monica scowled as she watched her father lead Olivia away. Don't make that face. Rachel quickly admonished her daughter. It's true, you told your dad you wanted someone more specific. He'll find you a tutor soon, don't worry. 
and don't whine either. Nobody likes that, especially your father. Olivia, meanwhile, followed her dad into his study and found a young man in a suit sipping tea. A foreboding sensation washed over her, prompting her to approach them cautiously. Michael gestured and said, Liv, let me introduce you. All right, Olivia replied, making her way toward the young man. Michael smiled and proceeded with the introduction. This is Jeff Dreyer, the son of our friend Shandy. He's currently pursuing a master's degree in psychology abroad. He's here on a month and a half break, and I invited him to be your temporary tutor. Olivia carefully scrutinized Jeff's features. Hello, he extended his hand. Hello. Olivia recalled Shandy Dreyer's glowing praise of her son at Rachel's birthday banquet. I'm conducting a psychological research project focused on teenagers. In a way, we can help each other. Jeff, a well-groomed man in his mid to late 20s, with neat short hair and donning a white shirt under a dark blue suit, explained. A golden Parker pen resided in his shirt pocket. Liv, you should learn from him. He was the top student when he studied at Marshall High. Michael interjected. Ah, those achievements are in the past. Jeff modestly replied, maintaining a reserved demeanor. Why don't you two head upstairs so you can go over her exam schedule with you? You can help her study. Michael gestured with a smile. Yes? Okay, Olivia acquiesced, turning to a nearby maid. Please show Jeff to my room and have him wait for a while. Yes, miss, the maid replied respectfully, addressing Jeff. Sir, please follow me. Thank you. Jeff smiled at Olivia and Michael before following the maid upstairs. Dad, why did you choose him? Olivia inquired, her confusion evident. Earlier this afternoon, I was in a meeting about a potential merger, and Shandy Dreyer was present too. She holds you in high regard, and during our conversation, the topic of finding you a tutor came up. Shandy suggested her son, and without hesitation, she arranged for him to come by. Michael's voice trailed off, finding it difficult to refuse such a kind offer. I see, Olivia expressed her understanding. I figure you'd appreciate him tutoring you through finals, and he can help you go over anything for the next month and a half once the next semester starts. Once that's over, I'll find you a reliable tutor for you, is that okay? Sure, Olivia smiled. I was just a little surprised. I'd expected a female tutor. Well, the next tutor will be a woman, Michael assured her. He had shared the same sentiment. However, due to the business ties between the Johnson and Dreyer families, it was difficult for him to refuse when they offered. All right, Dad, Olivia nodded, accepting the circumstances. She understood that certain situations were beyond her control and she had to play along. While making her way from the living room to her room, Olivia's thoughts revolved around her limited knowledge of Jeff Dreyer. She only recalled Shandy's anecdotes describing him as a filial and talented individual who disliked business. He preferred academia much more. In her previous life, Olivia had minimal interaction with him, but now he mysteriously emerged as her tutor. She found herself ill-prepared for this arrangement. Once inside her room, as the lesson commenced, Olivia's perception began to shift. Jeff's competence became apparent as he approached the material with clarity she hadn't yet experienced, particularly in English and chemistry. His presence proved immensely beneficial for Olivia. Let's conclude for today. Jeff Dreyer glanced at the time after two hours had gone by. Shall we continue at the same time tomorrow? Sure, Olivia agreed, amenable to the suggestion since she found his assistance helpful. But if possible, he added, would it be okay to ask for your assistance with something also? I'll tutor you free of charge in any subject you wish, and I'll make myself available during finals week so you can ask me questions at any time. But I request half a day on Sunday for the next six weeks, Jeff Dreyer explained, a smile playing on his lips. During that time, I'll need your help with my research project. Remember, we're mutually assisting each other. Is this psychological research going to involve dissecting someone or something? Olivia asked cautiously. 
No, it's relatively painless, I promise. Jeff laughed. Does that deal work for you, though? Olivia considered. I do need someone to help me study this week, and having him available around the clock is nice, so giving it a bit of time every Sunday for the next few weeks seems like a fair trade-off, especially considering he's not charging my father anything to tutor me. All right, she said. You got a deal. As Olivia escorted Jeff to the door, Monica watched. She was aware of Jeff Dreyer's reputation as an heir to the Dreyer family fortune. People always spoke highly of him. I better get someone just as good, she thought. She knew Jeff wasn't technically an Ivy League educated person, which she had insisted she wanted in a tutor, but still, he went to Oxford. Her dad should have known that that would be just as good. She huffed, frustrated that she only had herself to blame for giving her dad such specific instructions about what kind of tutor she wanted. It's not fair, she grunted. Now, Olivia's tutor is going to be better than mine. It didn't seem fair. Anger started to well up inside Monica. She couldn't accept it. She too wanted a tutor. And not just any tutor, but someone equally influential. She couldn't let herself be overshadowed by Olivia. Olivia noticed Monica's gaze and shook her head playfully. Typical Monica, she thought. Her half-sister would certainly stir up trouble again over this. And I'll be here waiting, ready to make you look bad again, Olivia smirked, and to slowly take you down. By the time Monday rolled around, Olivia had been studying so hard with her new tutor, Jeff, she felt ready to conquer her final exams. She felt grateful towards Jeff and her dad. Once finals were over, she was re-energized and excitedly welcomed winter break with open arms. On the final day of school for the year, Francis distributed the invitation cards for his family's company anniversary celebration to Olivia and the others. After receiving their invites, everyone gathered at Olivia's locker. The celebration starts at 7 p.m. on New Year's Eve, Wendy said. Should we all meet up beforehand and go together? Yeah, how about I pick you up at my mom's, Olivia said. Okay, Wendy nodded. Pick me up too, Millie said. Ooh, I can't wait to go shopping for this at my aunt's vintage store. I'm going to wear something epic. Wendy turned to Jeremy and asked, Jeremy, are you going? Nah, he shook his head. Not interested. That's a pity. It'd be nice to see you there. Wendy patted Jeremy's shoulder. Liv, can you give Chris's invitation to him for me? Francis asked Olivia. Pamela, who had been focusing on eavesdropping on their conversation, followed Francis as soon as he left Olivia's locker. She stopped at the water fountain beside his locker and pretended to take a sip of water as he grabbed his books. Hey, Francis, she said simply. Sup? Francis glanced at Pamela. This was the first time Pamela took the initiative to talk to him after the Cooper family gathering. I, um, I wanted to say thanks for, um for coming to my rescue at the Cooper family party the other day. Pamela slightly lowered her head and revealed a touch of shyness. Oh, of course, Francis waved his hand. Anyone would have done the same. I'm glad you're okay. Pamela looked up and her eyes were stubborn. Maybe, but when I was most afraid and helpless, it was you who saved me. I will never forget this kindness for the rest of my life. Uh, hearing Pamela say this, Francis did not know how to respond. I want to treat you to a meal tomorrow. Do you have any time? Pamela asked. No, sorry. Francis shook his head. I have to help my mom plan the family's company party. She wants me to look at catering stuff with her or something. He rolled his eyes. Oh, I've heard you talking about it. Pamela said. It sounds like it's going to be super fun. Her eyes lit up and showed that she was very interested in attending. Francis didn't know how to react. He was weary of Pamela, so he didn't know if he should extend an invite to her. Even though part of him felt bad, she had overheard everyone talking about the party and probably felt left out. I wonder if I can come? Pamela said finally, when Francis said nothing. Uh, Francis thought for a while and nodded, sure. Uh, where will it be exactly? Pamela asked. 
It will be on the third floor of the Pinnacle Hotel, Frances replied. Pamela smiled. Being able to tell people she was invited to an event as esteemed as this would surely give her clout. Watching Pamela's thoughts, Olivia's lips slightly raised. It seemed that Pamela had not given up yet. You're more resilient than I gave you credit for, Olivia thought, like a cockroach. She watched Pamela suck up to Francis. He was Pamela's most loyal guardian in her previous life and was Pamela's biggest financial backer. But in this life, Olivia would make sure that never happened again. She thought about the upcoming National Elite Student Competition that would happen next semester. At that time, Olivia, Pamela, and Mark DeLillo would be reunited once again for the first time in their lifetime. And this time, I'll be ready, she thought. Olivia spent much of her winter vacation hanging with friends and enjoying herself before she had to face her ultimate nemesis, Mark, again. It felt good to focus on things other than revenge occasionally, and so she put all her focus into planning her outfit for the New Year's Eve party that was going to be thrown by Francis's family's company. As the big event drew near, Olivia excitedly pulled on a lace sleeveless knee-length dress. She paired it with a leaf-shaped crystal necklace, black pantyhose, and a pair of deerskin boots. Finally, she took a handbag and a fur coat on her arm before heading out of her bedroom. At the corner of the corridor, Olivia bumped into Monica, who was also heading downstairs. She looked up and down at Olivia and asked, Where are you going? Not bothering to answer Monica, Olivia walked past her. Seeing Olivia ignore her like this, Monica bit her lower lip. This little bastard was too arrogant. Monica clenched her fist and lifted her hand. If I push her hard enough, Olivia will fall down the whole staircase. She thought, if Monica's luck was good, Liv could break her neck and die. Monica hesitated and frowned, though. If I don't push hard enough and she doesn't die, she'll be able to tell everyone I pushed her. And what if Daddy punished me or sent me away? Just as she was hesitating, Rachel's voice suddenly sounded from behind Monica. Sweetie! Rachel saw Monica's actions and knew what she was going to do. This silly child must not be so impulsive. Monica suddenly retracted her hand and turned her head to see Rachel's nervous face. Yes, mommy? Olivia heard Monica behind her and reacted by taking a step sideways to stand close to the wall. At that same moment, Monica turned further to face her mother, but accidentally took a reflexive step back as she did, and in doing so, accidentally stepped off the top stair. Whoa! Monica whimpered. Olivia's eyes went wide. She couldn't believe what she was seeing. Without even having to do anything, Monica accidentally started tumbling backward down the stairs. Monica! Rachel was stunned and immediately ran down the stairs. Monica! Mommy! Monica cried when she landed at the first landing in a heap. Where does it hurt? Tell Mommy where it hurts. Rachel turned around and shouted at a nearby maid, who watched in shock. Hurry and call an ambulance. What are you standing there for? Only then did the maid recover from her daze and immediately ran to call the hospital. Mommy, my hand hurts, Monica whimpered. I heard something pop. Don't worry, the doctor will be here soon. Rachel could not do anything other than comfort Monica. She did not dare to move Monica as she was afraid that she would hurt her mom. She only had one precious daughter. Seeing Monica's pain, Rachel's heart also hurt. She raised her head and hatefully stared at Olivia, who was still standing in the middle of the stairs. You had something to do with this. I did not, Olivia defended. She wasn't about to be roped into this. She had been so careful not to hurt Monica in any way that could be directly tied back to her. And now Rachel was sitting there accusing her of doing something she hadn't even done. Yes, you did. No, I didn't, and you know it. Olivia shook her head angrily. She wouldn't stand for this. She wasn't going to sit around and be accused of things she didn't do. She marched down the steps and stepped over her crying half-sister before heading for the door. Where are you going? Rachel yelled. You as well as I know that she was so clumsy she fell down the stairs, and my father isn't going to believe you lied, and neither will the maids. 
You know what happened the last time you had a servant lie for you. She watched as Rachel's mind flashed back to Hector, who had been unceremoniously fired for lying for Rachel. Rachel stifled her anger. Now, if you'll excuse me, Olivia smiled. I have a New Year's Eve party to attend. Pity Monica has to spend such a fun night in a hospital. Poor little clumsy girl. She slammed the door behind herself. Olivia happily got into her car with Morris Pratt and sped towards Manhattan, picking up Wendy first on their way to Francis's family's New Year's Eve party. After Wendy hopped in the back seat with her, they drove to Millie's. Millie's dress was similar to Olivia's, except it was vintage and one of a kind because it was from Millie's aunt's store. It was an elegant and feminine garment that exuded a touch of sophistication. The dress featured delicate lace fabric with intricate patterns, adding a hint of texture and visual appeal. The design showcased a fitted bodice that accentuated Millie's figure, and the dress flowed gracefully down to a modest knee length. Oh man, I should start borrowing dresses from you, Wendy said, looking at Millie. Mine's so plain. No, you look gorgeous, Millie told her. But when the car stopped at the entrance of the Pinnacle Hotel, and Wendy saw the crowd entering the lobby, she said, No, I feel way too underdressed. Look how nice everyone is. They're practically in ball gowns. Who cares? Olivia said. What you wear doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is how confident you are wearing it. Come on. Olivia and Millie walked to the hotel stairs, and only then did they realize that Wendy did not follow them. I'm too embarrassed. Wendy's face crumbled. My dress looks too cheap compared to everyone else's. Olivia and Millie looked at each other and helplessly shrugged. She wasn't going to listen to them. Forget it. Maybe you're right. Wendy shrugged her shoulders finally. What do I care if anybody judges my dress? That's the spirit. Millie cheered. Besides, I'm only here to see what the hundred-year-old celebration for a huge company looks like. Wendy added, I heard there were going to be live tigers and flamingos. Let's go. Let's go. Why don't you wear my coat? Olivia asked, if you're unhappy with your dress. No need, that doesn't match my jewelry anyway. I might as well just own my look. Wendy said as she linked arms with her friends. Let's go, we don't want to be late. Olivia nodded, and the three of them walked into the Pinnacle Hotel, entering a world of opulence and grandeur. They took the elevator to the third floor, eagerly anticipating the lavish party that awaited them. Stepping out of the elevator, their eyes were immediately drawn to a massive banner hanging in the grand foyer, proudly announcing the name of the company hosting the event. The surrounding decorations were a testament to luxury and extravagance, with cascades of shimmering fabrics, intricate floral arrangements, and sparkling chandeliers that bathed the space in a warm golden glow. The air was filled with an enchanting melody played by a live orchestra, adding to the ambiance of grand celebration. Impeccably dressed waitstaff circulated the room, offering guests flutes of champagne and delectable hors d'oeuvres meticulously crafted by renowned chefs. The venue itself boasted spacious ballrooms adorned with intricate details, from ornate ceiling moldings to exquisite hand-carved furniture. In one corner, a dazzling ice sculpture glistened, while in another, a luxurious photo booth enticed guests to capture memories of the extraordinary affair. As Olivia, Millie, and their companions made their way further into the party, they were immersed in a sea of elegantly attired guests, mingling and reveling in the extraordinary setting. It was a night of unparalleled indulgence, a true display of wealth and prestige that left everyone in awe of the extravagant hotel party. Wow! So cool, Wendy exclaimed when she saw there were zebras in a cage. I like zebras more than tigers anyway, she laughed. Millie looked at the people inside, and after confirming that she did not know anyone, she let out a sigh of relief. When they got to a room lined with dining tables, the three of them took out the invitation cards and were led to the corresponding seats by the waiter. Francis treated them quite well, it seemed, the seats were at a table closer to the front of the room, and Olivia was very satisfied with her seat. Just as she sat down, however, she heard an annoying voice coming behind her.
Olivia, what a coincidence! You were also invited here? Pamela wore light makeup and a pink dress. Her long hair, which was usually draped over her shoulders, was up in a bun. Yeah, Olivia glanced at her. Are you guys sitting here too? Pamela looked at her seat beside them. It wasn't the best table she could have been put at, but it was much better than her not having an invitation at all. Because Francis invited her last minute, Pamela wasn't actually assigned a seat. But she hoped if she just sat beside her classmates, nobody would notice. And if they did, she'd say it was just a mix-up and ask that one of the caterers bring her an extra chair or something. Pamela sat down on the empty seat beside Olivia. I guess I'm seated next to you guys. Olivia glanced at her. Did Pamela have no memory that they didn't like each other? Or was she deliberately playing dumb? She could tell Pamela didn't really have a seat assignment by reading her thoughts. Seeing Olivia's eyes, Pamela held her breath. But on the surface, she still had a decent smile. She did not want to go to the table at the back that Frances had brought her to. It was so far away. Who would notice her back there? She had spent a lot of money to buy new clothes for today. It was a hairstyle. Millie rolled her eyes. Clearly, she was very unhappy that Pamela was sitting beside her. Pamela naturally felt Millie's hostility, and this kind of disdain made her feel uncomfortable. She smiled and asked, Everything okay, Millie? A bookworm actually dared to look down on her? Millie ignored Pamela. She did not even want to say a word to her. Pamela bit her lower lip. What kind of attitude was this? Excuse me, can you get up? A male voice said behind Pamela's seat. Pamela turned and saw that it was Chris Jones. Stunned, she stood up in a daze and fiddled with her hair. Chris, what a coincidence. You took my place? Chris interjected, pointing to his seat. I am sorry, I didn't know there was someone in this seat. Pamela immediately moved aside and sat beside Wendy. Millie sneered coldly. I really don't know if you are stupid or blind, the seats are assigned. Pamela's expression changed and she glared at Millie with resentment and did not say anything else. Chris sat down and looked at Olivia. He stretched out his hand to pick up the messy hair on the side of his head. Come home with me later, Olivia whispered to him. If Chris was with her when she arrived home, Rachel might be less inclined to blame Olivia for Monica's fault, which Liv honestly had nothing to do with. She wasn't about to start getting blamed for Monica's accidents now, especially since one day she knew she really would be responsible for one. She couldn't look like she had a history of attacking or trying to hurt Monica if she ever wanted to get away with it in the future. Seeing Olivia's expression, Chris knew that she must have encountered some trouble again. Okay, he nodded. Pamela's face was dark as she watched Liv invite Chris over. Was Olivia deliberately showing off? Was there a need for this? Who was she putting on an act for? As she fumed, another person appeared behind the chair. Excuse me, I think you took my seat? Pamela turned, smiled, and apologized to the people behind her. Then she smiled at Olivia and the others and said, Looks like maybe I'm at a different table after all. Since Chris was there, she did not want to cause a scene or look stupid and stay. When she got up and passed by Chris's seat, Pamela accidentally tripped, but she held her hand on the edge of the chair and steadied her body. She turned her head and her eyes met the corner of Chris's mouth. Pamela was stunned for a moment. Chris was smiling at her, right? Pamela was immediately overjoyed. It seemed that Chris had feelings for her. Thinking this, Pamela flashed a smile at Chris. Then she gracefully turned around and made her way through the crowd. If he has feelings for me, that'll be good for my social status. If Chris knew what Pamela was thinking, he would have laughed. It was his fault for having a smile on his face. Francis walked over in a crisp suit, wearing a smile himself. Wow, Francis, you are very handsome. Wendy gave him a thumbs up. Well, you... Francis wanted to praise Wendy politely, but when he looked at her from head to toe, he could not find anything to praise. You are very casual tonight. Poofed. The others laughed good-naturedly, knowing that Wendy had made a fuss earlier about feeling underdressed for the event. Very funny. 
Wendy rolled her eyes at them and asked curiously, By the way, Francis, why did you invite Pamela? She said she wanted to join in on the fun. Francis shrugged. I felt bad. Millie frowned in disgust. At this time, a husband and wife in formal attire walked over. Olivia, long time no see. Hi, Mr. and Mrs. Peters. Olivia got up. She was nervous to see Francis's mother after the last time, but she maintained her smile. And you are... Francis's father looked at Chris suspiciously, feeling that he looked familiar. Chris stood up and stretched out his hand. Hello, I am Chris Jones, Olivia's fiancé. No, fiancé? Francis's parents were stunned. Both of them looked at Francis. Francis nodded to indicate that Olivia indeed had a fiancé. Only then did Francis's father extend his hand and shake Chris's hand. Ah, well, pleasure, Francis's mom said. Clearly a bit embarrassed, she made such a big deal of Francis dating Olivia the last time she saw her. If you'll excuse us, we must greet the rest of our guests. As they retreated into the crowd, an MC on stage announced, Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of our esteemed Peters Enterprise to deliver a speech. Applause erupted. Francis's father tugged at his clothes and ascended the stage, taking the microphone from the MC. Firstly, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to all the distinguished guests who have graciously joined us today, sacrificing their precious personal time. Today marks the 100th anniversary of Peter's Enterprise, merely a fleeting moment in history. However, to our corporation, it signifies the relentless efforts and dedication of three generations. My gratitude is beyond words on this occasion, and there's no need for inspirational speeches. We simply hope that our esteemed guests enjoy themselves. Applause filled the air once more. After Francis's father stepped down, the MC approached the podium, microphone in hand. He gestured for silence and continued. In a while, we will have a raffle. Each of you will find a pink note under your tableware. The number on your paper is your raffle ticket number, and we have an array of dazzling prizes awaiting you. From the latest phones to gold earrings, from iPads to Kindles, may luck be on your side. Applause followed once again. Pamela sat in the corner, rolling her eyes. She found such a rigged operation incredibly dull. It was obvious that the winners had already been predetermined because raffle tickets had been placed under assigned seats. How annoying, she thought. The celebration proceeded with musical performances and the arrival of food. Everything was sumptuous but Pamela barely touched her plate. Her objective today was not to indulge in the feast. No, she aimed to establish a connection with Francis's parents, though she was unsure how to approach them or what excuse to use. Observing them toasting and mingling with guests while holding their glasses, Pamela finally felt a glimmer of hope. However, either due to some time constraints or other reasons, Francis's parents did not venture towards the back of the banquet hall where she sat. And by the time she decided to go talk to them, it was already time for the raffle draw, so she had to stay in her seat. Pamela grew increasingly frustrated and anxious. She remained so far away from all the action. Pamela watched a woman conversing and laughing with Francis's mother, and her anger intensified, causing a physical ache in her stomach. Francis's mother drew the raffle tickets from the box filled with tickets. The first three winners turned out to be employees of the company. Pamela pursed her lips upon witnessing this, disdain in her eyes. Number 138. Francis's mother called out, scanning the room. Who is the lucky winner? Pamela suddenly remembered something and promptly checked her pink ticket. She was momentarily stunned before raising her hand. She had won a prize too? How? How? Number 138, quite a distance indeed, the MC remarked when he saw Pamela's hand go up in the far back of the room, his smile amusing the crowd. Number 138, please come on stage to claim your prize. Pamela rose and made her way to the front. Standing on the stage, she first shook hands with Francis's parents, then received the prize from his mother, a Kindle ebook. The MC handed her the microphone so she could thank the Peters family 
and Pamela took a deep breath. Finally, the moment she had been waiting for had arrived. She would use this moment not just to say thanks, but to make an actual speech. In her head, everyone wanted this from her. This was going to be her big moment. Hello, everyone. I am Pamela, a classmate of Francis. It's an honor to be invited to the 100th anniversary celebration of Peter's Enterprise. I'm grateful to receive this prize from the Peters. She spoke with poise, a gentle smile gracing her face. Clutching the microphone, she proceeded to express her admiration for Peter's Enterprise before finally curtsying and leaving the stage. Applause resonated as Pamela descended from the stage. A proud smile curved her lips. She had achieved the desired effect. That young lady was so sweet and elegant, wasn't she? Remarked the MC with a smile. Now let's invite Mrs. Peters back up to continue selecting the lucky winners. Number 222, announced Frances's mother. 222? Liv, I won a prize, Wendy exclaimed, staring at her ticket in disbelief. Go up and claim it. Liv replied, excited for her friend. Wendy hesitated. Will you go on my behalf? Look at what I'm wearing. It's not suitable and people will laugh. I'll get stage fright and feel silly. Number 222, are you forfeiting your prize? It's an iPad. The host announced from the stage. Uh, all right. Olivia reluctantly stood up and went on stage with Wendy's ticket. After receiving the iPad, she offered a brief word of thanks before returning. Wendy accepted the prize from Olivia and questioned, Why did you come back so quickly? Look how much Pamela said. Well, do you think anyone else would speak as much as Pamela? Olivia chuckled. It was simply Pamela's nature to seek the limelight. That wouldn't change. Just watch, though, she promised. Everyone will see that Pamela was trying to get attention here tonight, and her reputation will suffer. She smiled. She's going to suffer constantly if I have any say in it. As guests took to the dance floor following the raffle prizes were handed out, Wendy turned her gaze out the banquet's open double doors toward the hotel lobby and froze in place. Her heart seemed to skip a beat. Wendy? Millie noticed Wendy's hesitation and stopped, casting a curious glance her way. Wendy felt a tightness in her throat and abruptly dashed outside. When? Hello, Earth to Wendy. Olivia and Millie exchanged puzzled looks as they quickly followed, wondering what had happened. Dad? Wendy looked uncertainly at the middle-aged man with a protruding belly walking by in the lobby. Was it really him? After all these years, she couldn't be sure. Ever since he took all their money and ran off with Mo. Wendy had only seen him in the few remaining photographs around the house. Wendy stood and walked out into the lobby, which had been set up as a sort of seating area for mingling guests who wished to relax away from the dance floor and dining tables in the banquet hall itself. The hotel lobby exuded grandeur, with its red and gold ornate decor and a red carpet bisecting the room. Waiters in tuxedos lined both sides of the room, and a majestic concerto filled the air. The walls adorned with 18th century European style decorations appeared lifelike. Male guests wore suits and polished shoes, while female guests donned exquisite and expensive attire. Amidst this opulence, Wendy, dressed in her simple, continued to feel completely out of place. The man turned his head to look at Wendy and was taken aback when he saw her attire. He studied her face carefully for a moment before uncertainly uttering, Wendy? You... Wendy's lips trembled and she felt her throat drying up. Uttering a sound seemed difficult. She wanted to ask him why he had abandoned her and her mother all those years ago. She wanted to ask him how he had been all this time, but her words remained stuck in her throat. Wendy was abruptly interrupted by him. Why are you here? The man never expected to encounter Wendy in such a place. I... Wendy still struggled to speak. I am here. Are you here to hit me up for money? The man remarked, his disgust evident as he glanced at Wendy's clothes. Since she had chased him all the way here, what else could she possibly want? You must be desperate for money. 
the man looked around nervously, confirming that no familiar faces were nearby. He quickly approached Wendy and muttered in a low voice, You managed to track me down even here, you're ambitious. All of her thoughts were mercilessly shattered. Wendy stared at the disgust in the man's eyes, and her mind went blank in an instant. A chilling sensation spread from the depths of her heart to her limbs. Swiftly, the man took out $300 bills from his wallet and flung it at Wendy's face. Here you go. Don't come looking for me again. With those words, he hurriedly left. It hadn't been easy for him to climb up from a struggling reporter to his current position, and he couldn't be bothered by this mother and daughter pair. He considered the money spent as a means to rid himself of the problem. Wendy stood rooted to her spot, unable to recover from the shock for a long while. Guests passing by paused when they witnessed the scene. The sordid affairs of the wealthy were widely known, and perhaps this was yet another illegitimate child seeking recognition. Observing it, they chuckled and moved on with mocking smiles. Wendy's gaze slid from the middle-aged man's retreating figure to the money scattered at her feet. Wendy? Olivia looked at Wendy's back, wanting to say something, but finding herself at a loss for words. <laughs> Wendy let out a dry laugh, squatting down to pick up the money. She waved at Olivia and said, Look, I got 300 and an iPad tonight, lucky me. Observing Wendy force a smile, Olivia's heart ached. There was nothing she could say at that moment except silently reach out and grasp Wendy's hand. Let's go. I'll treat you both to dessert. We can go somewhere expensive, Wendy said, mustering a smile uglier than a tear-streaked face. Does this count as extortion? Ha, huh, how amusing. Wendy, let's go. Millie's eyes turned slightly red as she moved forward to hold Wendy's arm. Okay, let's go. Wendy firmly clutched the cash, her smile frozen and pained. Her throat tightened. Wendy seemed to have found an outlet to vent her anger. Her hands tightly gripped Olivia's waist as she began to sob, experiencing all the grievances she and her mother had endured. The notion of justice had been utterly crushed today. It was unfair. Utterly unfair. She despised her father. From the moment he left their home, from the time she and Desiree were looked down upon because of their money situation, her hatred grew. Yet no matter how strong her aversion was, she couldn't ignore the longing for paternal love deep within her heart. But in the eyes of others today, it was nothing but a cruel joke. It was a damn joke. Olivia tightly embraced Wendy, feeling the weight of her anguish as she read her thoughts. Tears streamed down her own face as she witnessed Wendy's heart-wrenching cries. She didn't know what more she could do aside from offering her shoulder to lean on. Helplessness and powerlessness... These feelings compelled her to yearn for strength. If Wendy hadn't been in this state today, she wouldn't have suffered such humiliation. She refused to let the person she cared about endure such pain. She absolutely would not allow it. I will kill him, Olivia thought, adding him to her list of people she would seek vengeance on. Hurting Wendy is like hurting me, and that man has humiliated and hurt her to her core, and I won't let him get away with it. Live your clothes. Wendy looked apologetically at Olivia's fur coat, noticing the mud stain on her shoulder. It seemed ruined by Wendy's tears and running mascara. It's all right, I'll take it to the dry cleaner. Olivia shrugged nonchalantly. Now, where would you like to go for dessert? I want to go home, Wendy said. I want to go straight home. The more she thought about it, the more she just wanted to leave, especially to see her mom. And let's go home. Olivia ruffled Wendy's head affectionately. I'll take you. No need. Wendy waved her hand. I'll take the bus back with Millie. Don't you want Chris to accompany you home? It's fine. Chris interjected. Liv and I will ride in my car. You two can ride with Liv's driver. All right, then it's settled. Olivia nodded. She didn't give Wendy a chance to refuse. She ushered Wendy and Millie into Boris Bratt's car. Morris, please see to it that Wendy and Millie get home safe. Once she waved goodbye, Olivia let out a heavy sigh. She felt exhausted. Chris looked at Olivia and smiled. 
if you're already tired now, what's the point of me accompanying you home? I need you. Olivia mustered her energy, nodding resolutely. She couldn't let herself give in to her exhaustion. If she was tired, how could she face the battle at the Johnson Mansion? As Chris's car smoothly made its way through the bustling streets of Manhattan, surrounded by towering skyscrapers and the vibrant energy of the city, the landscape gradually transformed before their eyes. The concrete jungle gave way to open spaces, and the honking of car horns was replaced by the gentle rustling of leaves. The scenery shifted from the bustling urban scene to the serene countryside, with rolling hills and expansive green fields stretching out as far as the eye could see. The drive took them on winding roads, bordered by quaint little towns and picturesque farmhouses. As they approached Olivia's mansion, nestled amidst the idyllic countryside, a sense of tranquility and anticipation filled the air, setting the stage for the moments that awaited them in this peaceful oasis. When they passed the bit of road that Olivia had killed Hector on, she felt slightly rejuvenated. Knowing what she was capable of in the past helped steel her against what she would have been up against in the future. As Chris's car pulled up the driveway, Olivia's imposing mansion came into view. The grandeur of the architecture was awe-inspiring, with its sprawling size and elegant design commanding attention. The mansion stood tall and proud, exuding an air of sophistication and refinement. The exterior was adorned with intricate details, from the ornate pillars that framed the entrance to the towering windows that reflected the surrounding landscape. The well-maintained gardens and manicured lawns added to the overall splendor, creating a sense of luxury and exclusivity. As soon as they stepped out of the car, Olivia heard Polly barking fiercely. Alarmed, she glanced at Chris and then rushed inside to find someone attempting to trap Polly with a rope. Spotting Olivia, Polly immediately barked, indicating that she was in danger and should stay away. Before Polly could react, a man swiftly looped the rope around its neck. Seeing an opportunity, another man swiftly threw a net over Polly's head. The more Polly struggled, the tighter the rope around her neck constricted. Oof! The suffocating sensation made Polly uncomfortable. Witnessing Polly's struggle, a third man grabbed a stick and prepared to strike it on the head. Stop! Olivia rushed forward, pushing the man away and snatching the stick from him. She swung it wildly at the other two men. Get lost now! Finally, Polly managed to break free, but the rope remained tightly bound around her neck. Seeing this, Chris stepped forward and untied the rope from Polly's neck. Polly growled menacingly at the three men. The fur around her neck was damaged, and her skin bore traces of blood from the rough rope, yet her ferocity remained unabated. Her sharp claws scraped against the floor, and her eyes gleamed with an insatiable thirst for blood that Olivia hadn't seen since she first laid eyes on Polly. You'd better step aside. Don't interfere with our work. The man whose stick had been taken by Olivia scowled. Where did this little girl come from? She was so annoying. Work? What work? Who asked you to catch my dog? Olivia's face was flushed with anger. We're from the pound, and he's from animal control. The man explained, we received a call claiming there were wild dogs causing harm here. Wild dogs? Are you blind? Would a wild dog really be so well-groomed? Olivia pointed at Polly. Which of you thinks she looks like a wild dog? Tell me the name of whoever made that call. Um, well, the three dog-catching team members were taken aback. They were just following orders. It was perfectly normal for them to come out and catch dogs upon receiving a call. I'm the one who made that call. Rachel's voice resonated from the staircase. Your dog went crazy and hurt your sister, Monica. This house is no place to keep dogs. What? Olivia was stunned. So you're spreading rumors that my dog is a wild dog? That she is responsible for Monica's stupid accident? Olivia raised an eyebrow. She knew Rachel would make a big fuss of Monica's fall, using it to her advantage however she could. But Olivia hadn't expected Rachel to actually go after Polly. I'm not spreading any rumors, Rachel shrugged. The dog you're raising was found on the street, so naturally it's a stray dog, and quite feral too. 
What do you mean? Chris frowned. He had made it clear last time that this dog was a gift for Olivia. What was Rachel trying to accomplish? Rachel only realized Chris's presence upon hearing his words. A flicker of unease crossed her eyes, but she managed to regain her composure in time. Whatever the case, she had to get rid of this dog today. She would be bothered by its presence, and she didn't want Monica to be hurt in vain. I didn't say anything, Rachel replied, trying to maintain a smile. I'm just questioning whether Liv is capable of taking care of a dog. She's young and often isn't at home. If the dog isn't properly trained, it might become aggressive and harm people. Dogs aren't the one causing harm. It's certain people who can't control themselves, Olivia retorted, her face growing cold. I want to see who dares to take my dog away today. Tension filled the air. Rachel's face contorted with anger, while Olivia refused to back down. Polly remained on guard, its claws and teeth sharp, intimidating the dog-catching team. Even Chris felt his anger flare up. In the midst of this standoff, Michael's voice called out from outside the door. What's going on? Dad! Olivia's eyes sparkled as Michael entered the room. What's happening? Michael asked, his face filled with confusion. Sweetheart, something bad happened. Monica fell down the stairs and got hurt, Rachel said, her eyes welling up with tears. Oh, how did that happen? Is she seriously injured? Michael asked, his voice tinged with anxiety. It's not too serious, luckily. The doctor said it was just a sprain. With some rest and recovery, she'll be fine, Rachel explained, her tone tinged with a sense of injustice. That's a relief. Michael exhaled deeply, visibly relieved. But why did she suddenly fall down the stairs? As Monica was going downstairs, Liv's dog bumped into her and she accidentally tumbled down, Rachel explained, her eyes turning dark. Oh, is that so? Michael was taken aback, looking at Olivia for confirmation. No, I've already explained to these men who are trying to take Polly that she didn't do it and there's no evidence. Monica got hurt because she lost her balance on the stairs. Olivia retorted, rolling her eyes. Are you seriously trying to imply that I'm accusing you right now? Rachel retorted, her gaze fixed on Olivia. You're not accusing me, you're accusing my dog. Let's be clear about that. Olivia retorted, turning to Polly. Polly, did you do anything wrong while I was away? Because I know you didn't do anything while I was here, which is when we all saw Monica fell. Polly innocently looked at Olivia, tilting her head. What can a dog understand? Rachel grew angrier, observing Polly's limited comprehension of human emotions. It's a shame that dogs often understand better than humans. Olivia glanced at Rachel before shifting her gaze to Michael. Dad, what do you think we should do? This, Michael frowned, contemplating his words. This dog. Polly whimpered, lying on the ground with a tilted head. Her blue eyes brimmed with sadness. The blood on its neck appeared increasingly pitiful. She stared at Michael, emitting a mournful sound from its throat. Witnessing this, Michael was at a loss for words, unsure of how to proceed. He glanced at Rachel and then back at Olivia. What about Monica? Monica was in pain, crying out for her father and mother after the fall, Rachel said, her eyes moist with tears. Olivia is obviously just trying to protect her new dog. Ah, Michael looked at Olivia again. Liv, let's handle it this way, Olivia interjected a glint of cunning in her eyes as she cleared her throat. When I'm not at home, I'll lock Polly in my room and not let her out. Pausing momentarily, she continued, But if someone deliberately enters my room seeking trouble, I won't be able to control what happens. No! Rachel immediately objected. She found such a solution unacceptable. What do you propose then? Michael looked at Rachel. This dog must be removed! Rachel insisted. What if Monica gets hurt again? A sprain is one thing. 
But if something worse happens in the future, how can I live with that? In that case, I might as well not lock Polly at all. Instead, you should tightly lock Monica's room. Don't let her go out, or else she might get hit by a car and die. Olivia retorted coldly. You! How can you say that? Rachel's expression turned cold. Monica is your younger sister. How can you curse her like that? Didn't you say that? If something really happens to Monica, how will you live? I'm doing this for your sake. The chances of getting hit by a car outside are much higher than the risks associated with my Polly. Why didn't you mention that? Olivia countered. That's different. Rachel responded, feeling frustrated. Monica is at home. I can't let these dangers stay by her side. Didn't I say when I'm not at home, I'll lock Polly in my room? Why don't you understand? Olivia frowned, finding Rachel's aggression increasingly exasperating. She also realized that continuing this argument would only further irritate Michael. Thus, Olivia subtly signaled to Polly. This dog cannot remain alive, Rachel insisted, her brows furrowing. So you just don't like me, is that it? Are you going to destroy everything I cherish before you give up? Olivia's eyes flashed with intensity as she stared at Rachel with deep-seated resentment. Meanwhile, Polly noticed Olivia's subtle hand signal and cautiously crawled toward Michael's feet. Hearing Olivia's words, Rachel realized she had gone too far. She took a deep breath, attempting to portray herself as a caring and reasonable mother. Liv, you misunderstood. I'm just concerned about your well-being. Today, it was Monica who got hurt because your puppy was being careless and isn't well-behaved since she's a stray from off the streets. But next time, it could be you. Polly and I haven't had any incidents for a long time. It's been quite some time since Polly came to the Johnson Mansion, and she's always been well-behaved, Olivia said, her voice filled with anger. My question is, since you're so convinced Polly caused Monica to fall, which I know she didn't, but if you think she did, then why did Polly bump into Monica? She wouldn't harm someone without reason. Before Rachel could respond, Olivia continued, Remember when you had your dog Candy here? Candy barked incessantly in the house, and if it hadn't been for Polly's intervention, Candy would have bitten me. Now that you've sent Candy away, promise me you won't bring her back for the rest of your life, and you will put her down too. By the same logic, if we are going to punish Polly, then we need to punish Candy in the same way for trying to attack me too. Well, wait a second, hold on, I didn't mean that. Rachel stammered, realizing her mistake. She had invested a lot of money in her champion dog. She couldn't just abandon her or put her down because it had gone after Olivia once. All of her efforts would be wasted. Gandy has undergone special training. She's different from this wild dog. Wow, so you're really still saying that the dog I gave to my fiancé is a wild dog? Chris raised an eyebrow. Uh, um, no, sorry, that's not what I meant. Rachel hurriedly clarified. This was all Olivia's fault. She had completely forgotten that Chris Jones was present because he was so quiet and he stood slightly behind Rachel's periphery. Watch your words, Chris warned, his tone icy. Chris, please don't misunderstand. I'm simply saying that this dog is too difficult to train. It will take time for it to regain its natural instincts and be a good dog after being on the streets fending for itself, Rachel explained. Polly has a better memory than some people, Olivia retorted with a snort. Enough arguing, Michael interjected, his frown deepening. His temples throbbed with pain. After a long day of work, he had hoped to come home and relax, but it seemed increasingly difficult. Olivia and Rachel fell silent after being scolded by Michael. The living room fell into a quiet lull, and the three dog catchers felt awkward and out of place in the middle of this family argument. They contemplated leaving, but since they hadn't captured the dog yet, it didn't feel right to depart abruptly. Moreover, if it was indeed that the dog had caused harm, they couldn't allow it to remain in the vicinity. Rachel also understood that the ultimate decision rested with Michael. Hoping to elicit sympathy, she was about to shed a few tears when she noticed that the detestable dog 
had already scampered to Michael's feet. It affectionately rubbed her head against Michael's pants, displaying a fawning behavior that made Rachel nauseous. Polly nudged Michael's ankles and calves with her head and emitted a sound of endearment from her throat. She appeared weak and docile, imploring for affection. Michael, witnessing Polly's behavior, felt the frustration in his heart dissipate instantly. He squatted down and stroked Polly's head. Polly extended her tongue and licked Michael's palm, emitting a whimper. Her actions were tender and sweet. Be good, Michael whispered as he patted Polly's back. He remembered secretly raising a dog when he was young. His parents didn't really like indoor pets, so he had one of his butlers help care for the animal in the stables, and he would visit with the pup every day after school for years. Some nights, he would sneak it up to his room when his father Jack was at work and his mother was at social functions. Though he couldn't recall the exact breed, he knew it was sweet and docile. A faint smile appeared on the corner of Olivia's lips as she watched her father's thoughts. She surreptitiously gave Polly a thumbs up, unnoticed by Michael. Polly playfully blinked in response. A flame ignited within Rachel's eyes. Michael! No need to say any more, Michael commanded, stopping her. Let's do as Liv suggested. Let's keep Polly in Liv's room when she's not around. We can have one of the maids check on her. It's what I did with my butler and my dog in youth, he thought. But Monica... Rachel was reluctant to give up. Monica only suffered a sprain. Take good care of her. I'll visit her later and remind her to be more cautious in the future, Michael assured. Besides, Polly will be kept locked up so she won't cause harm. Rachel listened to Michael's words, biting her lower lip unwillingly. She felt that Michael had gone too far. How could he be so biased? So then, are we not taking this dog? The three members of the dog-catching team couldn't hold back any longer. Observing Olivia's troubled expression upon hearing this question, a glimmer of joy flickered in Rachel's eyes. No, said Morris Pratt, who had accompanied Michael into the house without opening his mouth from start to finish, pushed his glasses up the bridge of his nose with his index finger. I'll see to it that we take this dog into the vet to treat her wounds and make sure she is cared for and has all the necessary paperwork. Thank you, Morris. Olivia expressed her gratitude with a smile and a nod. It's my duty, Morris responded. Morris is truly competent, Rachel commented coldly. It's part of my job. Morris nodded again. Rachel was momentarily speechless, glaring at Polly, who was enjoying Michael's affection. The more she looked at the dog, the more she detested it. Why didn't you take proper care of the dog I gave you? Chris's tone turned icy as he turned and whispered to Rachel, low and grizzled so Michael couldn't immediately hear. If something were to happen, how would you compensate me? Rachel's expression froze upon hearing Chris's words. Chris, it's all a misunderstanding. Michael intervened when he realized the young man was addressing his wife. Indeed, it's best if it's just a misunderstanding. I don't want people to think they can easily bully me just because I'm not in London and my family has less of an established presence here in the States. Chris's words were directed at Rachel. Let's not delve into other matters. It wouldn't be difficult for a family with incestuous tendencies to disappear from Manhattan with just a single sentence. He was obviously referring to Rachel's brother and daughter-in-law, who were caught having an affair at the Patriarch's birthday banquet. Rachel's back tensed as she comprehended Chris's intentions. She knew he wasn't joking. Though he was absent from London, Chris represented the Jones family's authority. With a single word from him, other companies in New York City would no longer dare to cooperate with the Cooper family going forward. At that point, even the Johnson family wouldn't be able to protect the Cooper family. Michael's expression didn't appear favorable. It hadn't been easy for him to help the Cooper family regain their footing after Kenneth's birthday banquet fiasco, so he couldn't suffer another setback now. The atmosphere grew increasingly tense once again. Olivia realized that Chris was supporting Polly. After this, Rachel probably wouldn't dare to pay any more attention to Polly. Grateful, she gazed at Chris, meeting his slightly angered gaze. 
Seeing Olivia, that anger unconsciously dissipated, leaving only a gentle smile on his lips. At that moment, Chris's driver, Sven, abruptly entered, breaking the tension. Sir, I apologize for interrupting, but you are needed back home within the hour. Hmm. Chris glanced at Olivia and said, I'll be leaving then. Okay, Olivia responded, nodding. Thank you, she added. Always. Chris smiled and ruffled Olivia's hair. Without uttering another word, he turned and followed his driver out of the Johnson mansion. The three of you, please. Morris Pratt gestured to the three members of the dog-catching team. Let me see you out. The three men were glad to be leaving. They found matters involving the wealthy class to be quite terrifying. Yet, the most terrifying aspect was the woman from affluent families. With the departure of the outsiders, Michael stated, Rachel, is Monica in her room? I'll go check on her. Yes, Rachel conceded. At this point, she couldn't argue further. Now, she could only find a way to make Michael show more concern for Monica. Liv, let's go upstairs and see, Michael told Olivia. After all, since Rachel insisted Monica had been injured by Polly, Olivia should visit with her younger sister and make her feel better. I'm not going, Olivia shook her head. I want to take Polly to the veterinary hospital with Morris. In her current condition, it might develop tetanus if not treated properly. Michael considered his daughter's words as he looked at Polly's bloody fur coat. In that case, you can go, Michael agreed. After admitting Polly to the veterinary hospital, the young nurses who had cared for the injured dog couldn't help but shed tears upon witnessing its severe condition. She had been much more injured than Olivia originally thought. I'm going to kill you. Olivia promised, thinking of how Rachel had tried to do away with Polly. I thought I wanted to end you before, but now I'm going to completely destroy you first, so there's not even a memory of you when I'm done with you. When they heard Olivia describing the treatment the dog catchers had subjected Polly to, the young nurses trembled with disgust. However, Polly, ever perceptive, showered the nurses with affectionate licks, until the nurses found themselves laughing once again, as the dog's antics brought them joy. The vet assessed Polly's condition and recommended keeping her at the hospital for a few days to recover. Olivia believed the hospital would provide a safer environment than her father's mansion, so she agreed. Monica was impulsive by nature, and if she became enraged and did something irrational, it wouldn't be worth endangering Polly. Upon leaving the veterinary hospital, Olivia received a call from Chris. Hello? I want to take you out tomorrow, Chris proposed. What if I don't have time? You'll have to go out and enjoy tomorrow all by yourself, Olivia replied, a slight curl forming on her lips. Do you have plans tomorrow? Chris frowned. Yes, I have something to attend to, Olivia confirmed. I have an appointment. Can't you cancel it? Chris persisted. No, she asserted. Olivia had promised her new tutor, Jeff Dreyer, that she would dedicate tomorrow to help him with his psychology study. She had noticed remarkable progress in her own studies recently, all thanks to Jeff, so she felt the need to repay him properly. She disliked Owen favors, especially since she had already found Owen Chris troublesome enough sometimes. Should she accumulate another debt with Jeff? It was best to let go of the idea. Chris grew slightly irritated for some reason. Then forget it, he responded before abruptly hanging up the phone and casually tossing it aside. Chris, why are you being so silly? Just tell her it's your birthday tomorrow, Chris's driver Sven remarked while munching on instant noodles on Chris's couch. If she knew, she would probably cancel her plans and see you. Why are you choosing to be so coy? Enough with the nonsense, Chris frowned, glancing at Sven. Why haven't you found anything more on Duke Lee after all this time? Don't blame me for this, Sven exclaimed. This kid is incredibly elusive. Dave, Simon, and I were in different countries, yet we still couldn't catch him, even when we split the work up. Why didn't you tell me that you guys were useless? Chris furrowed his brow. Don't start with me. 
Sven appeared indignant, as if insulted. Let me tell you, you can question my character but never doubt my capabilities. Chris's mouth twitched. It wouldn't be fair to say you lack modesty, he remarked, having never encountered someone so shameless before. Hmm, what good is having shame? Sven raised his chin proudly. At that moment, the computer emitted a beep, signaling the arrival of an encrypted email. Sven set aside his half-eaten instant noodles. Wow, speak of the devil, it's a message from Dave Simon. Hmm? Chris stood up and inquired. What's the news? It's a picture. Give me a moment to decrypt and download it. Sven grumbled as he skillfully decoded the message. Damn it, David. Last time it was the MOS password, and now it's an encrypted keychain password again. Such a hassle. How many brain cells do I have to waste deciphering passwords? If this isn't crucial information, I'll use that insolent brat's leg as a baseball bat. Enough with the chatter, can you download the picture or not? If you can't, let me handle it, Chris urged, his frown deepening. Hey, don't rush me, I'll figure it out, Sven retorted. He pressed the return key and gazed at the downloaded picture. Huh? Who is this person? Step aside. Chris pushed Sven away from the screen and carefully examined the photo. In the picture, a young man stood surrounded by a few bodyguards. He appeared to be around 18 years old with long black hair, blue eyes, fair skin, and a cold expression. Although the photo had been taken discreetly, it was quite clear. Chris stared at the image and murmured, Duke Lee. What? Sven looked at Chris with a mournful gaze. What did you say? Duke Lee, Chris repeated without averting his gaze. He is the Duke Lee I've been searching for. Him? Sven set aside his usual cynicism and examined the photo. He interlaced his fingers and stretched. Well, with these photos, further investigation will become much easier. This damn Duke Lee has wasted so much time. But now that I have a visual, I'll dig up all the information I can on this guy. I'll leave it to you. Chris's eyes darkened. Duke Lee could potentially pose a major threat to Chris so he needed to gather everything he could on the guy. Meanwhile, still in Morris Bratt's car, Olivia was taken aback by the dial tone on the other end of the line after Chris abruptly hung up on her. What on earth? Is he angry? Shaking her head, Olivia pocketed her phone, choosing to ignore it. Upon returning home, Michael insisted that she visit Monica. When Olivia laid eyes on her sister's feeble appearance, crying out in pain for their parents. She couldn't help but feel annoyed. Mommy, Daddy, it hurts so much. Monica's eyes were swollen and red from incessant crying. Damn it, why hadn't that wretched dog been hauled away and put down? This is too much. Olivia, be a good girl. Rachel wiped away her tears as she tried to console her. The pain will subside in a few days. Be good. Your father is here with you. Just be good. Yes, Michael frowned and added. Your sister has come to see you. Then he turned to Olivia. Liv, comfort your sister as well. Olivia hesitated. Yep, just here to make sure you're feeling all right. You look like you're in pain. Monica narrowed her eyes, unsure if that was an insult. She knew her half-sister didn't really care about her well-being. You! Get out! Monica seethed with anger panting heavily and forgetting to pretend to be in pain. She snatched up a pillow and hurled it at Olivia. You're not actually concerned about me. Monica wished she would die. Easily evading the pillow, Olivia let out a contemptuous laugh. Wow, you suddenly have so much energy. Maybe you're not in as much pain as I thought a moment ago. Sarcasm dripped from Olivia's lips, causing Monica's arrogance to fade instantly. She turned to Michael, seeking his support. Michael was taken aback for a moment and sighed heavily. Monica just loves to be spoiled by you, Michael. Rachel hurriedly interjected, trying to explain why Monica was playing up her sprained ankle for dramatic effect and pretending to be far more injured and in pain than she really was. Monica, you should rest and recover, Michael said, rising from his seat. 
Honey, wait. Rachel wanted to say more to keep him there, but Michael raised his hand, cutting her off. I still have some work documents to review. Michael sighed once again, walking out of the room. Goodbye, Dad. Olivia waved at his departing figure. Once the door closed, the room fell into silence. Liv, you're quite something. Rachel's smile was faint, her gaze filled with gloom. Thank you for the compliment, Auntie Rachel. Olivia turned to face Rachel, sporting the same smile. You're not bad either. After all, we're from the same family. And Monica, why haven't you learned your lesson? Have you ever spoken without it causing trouble? If I were you, I'd just keep my mouth shut. It would benefit everyone. Monica's face turned red, and she clenched her teeth in frustration. Olivia couldn't get away with this. Liv, do you really believe that with your limited intelligence, you can permanently establish yourself in New York City? Rachel smiled coldly. Stupid girl. This won't last for you, you'll see. Auntie, after all this time, do you truly believe that my success is solely due to my eloquence and limited intelligence? Olivia raised an eyebrow. Oh, right, there's also a man. Rachel laughed. How could I forget? You still have Chris Jones to support you. Compared to relying on men, I'm certainly not as skilled as you, Auntie. Olivia took a step forward, tilting her head as she gazed at Rachel. Stealing a man is the better option, isn't it? Yes, Rachel smirked triumphantly. Michael had been won over by her own abilities. What was there to worry about? In that case, savor this moment. Olivia raised her chin provocatively. Because it's temporary. You'll be returned to where you came from sooner or later. Oh, I highly doubt that. Rachel met Olivia's gaze. Then just wait and see. Olivia, wearing a satisfied smile, exited Monica's room. Once the door closed, Monica fumed. Mommy, Olivia is too arrogant. I should have pushed her down the stairs today without any hesitation. You dare say such things. Rachel frowned. I haven't scolded you yet. Monica shrunk back, her neck retracting. Do you realize that if she falls to her death, you'll pay with your life? Rachel's frown deepened. Is her wretched life worth the same as yours? And even if she died, do you think that would solve the problem of her current place in your father's heart? Can a push fix that? What should we do then? Monica's eyes filled with grievances. I hate her. I just want her dead. I hate her more than you do. And it's not just her. I hate her mother as well. I hate Victoria Park. I hate everything associated with her. Rachel's eyes briefly flashed with the viciousness that quickly dissipated. But I love your father. We have limitations just like you. Our lives are far more valuable than any gold. We must think carefully before taking any action. We mustn't throw our lives away. It's not worth it. What should we do, Mommy? We can't let Olivia snatch Dad away from us. Monica anxiously whined. Daddy belongs to us. I know. Rachel's gaze grew resolute. Your father is mine. No one can take him away. Then what should we do? Monica repeated, more urgently now. She felt waiting idly like this wasn't an option. Why don't we kill Olivia's mother? That way, Olivia would never dare to snatch her father away. Besides, Grandfather said we couldn't touch Olivia, but he never said anything about her mother. No, Rachel shook her head reflexively. She knew how badly she wanted to kill Victoria. Nobody wanted it more than her. He would hate me. Michael may not love Rachel, but she couldn't bear for him to hate her for killing Victoria. Even if it was just a look of disgust from him, Rachel couldn't endure it. That's not an option either. Monica grew flustered and exasperated. Then what should we do? We wait. Rachel's gaze grew resolute. Wait some more? Monica grew frustrated. Mommy, why do we always have to wait? What are we waiting for? We're waiting for your uncle and your brother to return. Rachel reached out to stroke Monica's head, her gaze filled with tenderness. When they come back, 
We'll find a way to get Olivia out of this mansion. My little brother's coming back? Monica's eyes lit up. Her memories of Edward were hazy because he was sent to Europe to be mentored by his uncle so early, but she vaguely remembered him being a shy little boy. However, that was insignificant. What mattered was that her little brother was the pride of the Johnson family because he was Michael's only son, and Monica felt proud too. If she revealed that her little brother was a disciple of her uncle Bruno, a master chef, everyone would admire her. Yes, Rachel nodded. But Uncle Bruno, Monica hesitated. Will Uncle really help us? She felt a little apprehensive about Bruno. There was something off about him, something eerie. He will. Rachel's eyes gleamed with confidence. He definitely will. Just like 17 years ago, Rachel was certain that Bruno would wholeheartedly help her. He was the only person in this world, aside from her, who would go to such lengths. That would be great. Monica smiled once again. This time, Olivia won't stand a chance. Turning to face Rachel, she brimmed with anticipation. Mommy, when will Uncle and my little brother come back? They'll be back during the spring, Rachel replied. Although she secretly hoped that Bruno would never return for the rest of her life, for personal reasons, she still had to rely on him for help when the time came. Okay, Monica nodded with excitement. She didn't know why, but she had a feeling that this time it would work out, and they would finally successfully ruin Olivia. Unlike Monica, who was filled with anticipation and joy, Rachel felt a mix of happiness and worry. She herself wasn't certain of the outcome this time. Still, she had no choice but to give it her all. Olivia was like a malevolent demon emerging from the depths of hell to collect debts, a formidable and relentless adversary. On Sunday, Olivia rose from her bed and gazed out the window while combing her hair. Despite the sunny weather, her room remained untouched by the sun's rays due to its poor window placement, which made it feel damp and cold. As she muttered to herself, the winter sunlight is unreliable enough as it is. Olivia proceeded to change her clothes. She discarded her pajamas and donned a white shirt, a v-neck woolen sweater, and a combination of warm tights and a plaid skirt. Finally, she adorned herself with a red cap, a half-body cloak, and a pair of leather boots. Grabbing her bag, she departed from the bedroom. Upon descending the stairs, Olivia discovered everyone gathered in the dining room, enjoying their breakfast. She approached and greeted, Good morning, Grandpa. Good morning, Dad. Once she was seated, Olivia shifted her gaze to Rachel and added, Morning, Auntie. Morning, Grandpa Jack replied, glancing briefly at Olivia before diverting his attention elsewhere. He couldn't be bothered with the affairs of the younger generation. Liv, are you going out today? Michael inquired. Yes, Olivia replied, taking a sip of milk. My tutor Jeff asked me to assist him with his research project today. Just you? Monica scrutinized Olivia, her aversion growing, especially after the incident with her sprained ankle. When Olivia was unscathed, she glared at her angrily and questioned, Isn't that weird? What do you mean? Olivia set down her milk and picked up a piece of buttered toast. It was definitely crispy. Taking a bite, she relished the satisfying crunch. The sound of the bite made her eyes light up. The bread had been baked to perfection. Jeff Dreyer holds a master's degree in psychology. What contribution can you possibly help him make in his research project? Monica glanced at Olivia and noticed some crumbs falling onto the table as she ate. She curled her lips in disdain. How uncouth. Are you doubting my abilities? Olivia finished her toast and reached for another piece, this time spreading peanut butter on it. You don't possess a master's degree in psychology, so how can you be certain that I won't be of assistance? With that said, she took a bite. The combination of rich peanut butter, the aroma of the toast, and the lingering flavor in her mouth brought her great delight. After devouring her toast, Olivia turned her head and noticed Jeff's car pulling into the Johnson family's courtyard. She hastily finished her milk, proclaiming, I'm full. 
You haven't touched your grilled sausages and potatoes, Michael reminded her. They're too greasy. I don't want them. Olivia shook her head and reached for an apple on the table. This is sufficient. Take your time, everyone. As she rose from her seat, Jeff entered the main hall, led by a servant. Good morning, everyone. Jeff Dreyer is here. Have you had breakfast? Rachel asked, wearing a smile. I have, thank you. Jeff replied with a smile and a nod. Jeff, try some more. The bread today is delicious. Monica invited him, a smile on her face. Deep down, she was seething. A genius like Jeff was wasting his time teaching Olivia, a worthless interloper. Yes, sit, Rachel added, smiling faintly. Jeff, I'm also free at home today, Monica suggested, thinking that if they spent the day together, Jeff would surely realize how much more helpful she was compared to Olivia. Perhaps she could become his mentor. What if I... Let's go quickly. Olivia walked toward Jeff before brushing past him. Goodbye, everyone. Jeff turned around and followed Olivia without waiting for Monica to finish speaking. Monica bit her lower lip unhappily. Exiting through the door, Olivia took her place in the front passenger seat, fastening her seatbelt. She glanced at Jeff, who also secured his seatbelt before starting the car. Where are we headed? Jeff didn't respond, because he was busy wondering how he could best achieve a sense of equality between himself and Olivia, so she didn't think of him as an authority figure. Referring to himself as a teacher would create a divide between them, hindering his research. Jeff? Olivia smiled. Where are we going? After maneuvering the car out of the mansion's driveway, Jeff smiled. I'm taking you to... have fun. Have fun? Olivia was taken aback. Aren't we supposed to be doing work on a research project? Yes. Jeff smiled and asked. Did you think I would take you to the laboratory, where you'd be covered in tubes and various instruments? Um, to some extent... Olivia had assumed that the basic tasks would involve filling out numerous psychological test reports or something. I believe you have a misconception about psychology research, Jeff said. A profound one, indeed. Is that so? Olivia's curiosity was piqued. Then what does psychology research entail, in your opinion? It depends on how you perceive it, Jeff replied. Would you like some music? Sure, Olivia shrugged. All right, then. Jeff reached out and turned on the music. Instantly, hip-hop tunes filled the car. I didn't expect you to like hip-hop. Olivia expressed her surprise. Based on their interactions, she had assumed that Jeff preferred jazz, blues, or folk ballads or something. Aha, didn't see that coming, did you? Jeff casually responded, using the corner of his eye to carefully observe Olivia's facial expressions. He made mental notes of the corresponding emotions, officially commencing his psychological research. After driving for nearly an hour, the car came to a halt in the parking lot. Jeff unfastened his seatbelt and announced, We've arrived. Here? Olivia looked at the massive Ferris wheel nearby. The amusement park? That's right. Jeff nodded, producing two tickets he had purchased in advance. Don't you like amusement parks? Um... Olivia hesitated. It wouldn't hurt to indulge in some fun occasionally, would it? She decided to treat this day as a break and enjoy herself. Sure, she said finally, though she was very unsure what Jeff had in store for her or what his intentions were. From reading his mind, all she could hear him thinking was, while you enjoy today, I'm going to study you. Staring at the information on his computer screen, Chris Jones furrowed his brow. Duke Lee was proving more dangerous than Chris had anticipated. Duke Lee's influence extended not only throughout Europe, but also Chris had yet to uncover the mastermind behind Duke Lee. It was hard to believe that a 20-year-old Italian youth possessed such power and influence. Even his name was enigmatic, clearly a fictitious name or an alias he'd adopted. So what was his real identity? Lost in thought, Chris found his view obstructed by a hand reaching out to block his sight from the screen. Chris, it's your birthday today. Take a break and go out for a walk. Move aside, Chris replied, lacking the mood to go for a stroll. Come on, 
Sven shook his head. You can't give up just because your crush ignored you. It's your 18th birthday. A once-in-a-lifetime occasion. What makes this birthday different from any other? Chris retorted, rolling his eyes at Sven. Did you celebrate your 17th birthday twice? Sven paused, taken aback. No, 18 is the age of legal adulthood. It's not the same. After 18, you're considered a man. You can vote. You can go out and do things. So, are you saying I wasn't a man before? Chris narrowed his eyes, finding Sven's audacity growing. How could I dare? Sven exclaimed, startled. What I meant is that after 18, it's... It's different from being in a relationship during your younger years. Don't interrupt my work. Sven frowned, exiting Chris's room. When he got out into the hallway, he dialed a number. Hello. Vera, Chris is being uncooperative. I need you to come out and intervene. In less than a half an hour, Vera arrived. Her vibrant red outfit still managed to catch attention even in the cold winter. Chris, get up. Vera... Chris looked at her in surprise. What are you doing here? Don't play dumb, I've already bought the tickets. Vera waved the tickets in her hand. Come to the amusement park with me. Chris stared at the tickets, taken aback. You? Playing in an amusement park? What's that supposed to mean, Chris? Vera clenched her jaw. I'm not even 30 yet, alright? Even if I were 30, I could still go to the amusement park. Haven't you heard that there's a little girl inside every woman? Um... Chris pondered for a moment and said, All right. He couldn't quite comprehend what was going on, or why Vera was suddenly insisting that they have a fun day. But he figured he wouldn't turn down his cousin's invitation to hang out, especially on his birthday. She was always looking out for him. It was the least he could do. You stay here and continue working. Chris instructed Sven, grabbing his coat. If I don't have any new progress when I come back, we'll have problems. Chris and Vera drove straight to the amusement park after leaving the house. After getting in the long line at the entrance and presenting their tickets, they finally entered the park. It didn't take long for Chris to realize what a foolish decision he had made. The park was bustling with noise and commotion. Costume characters roamed around and a group of mischievous kids gathered around a dinosaur mascot, kicking and hitting it. Chris winced at the sight, feeling sympathy for the mascot, but the parents of those kids were too engrossed in chatting and taking selfies to intervene. Why did such an overrun, tedious place like an amusement park even exist? Let me see, what should we try first? Vera took out the park map and examined it. Ooh, why don't we start with the spinning teacups? It can be a warm-up. Sure, Chris replied, not particularly enthusiastic. The line for the spinning teacups wasn't too long, and soon Vera and Chris settled into a coffee-colored teacup, fastening their seatbelts. Unbeknownst to Chris, however, as his teacup started spinning, Olivia Johnson and her tutor Jeff had just exited the nearby Jungle Expedition ride. Did you like that one? Jeff asked. Yeah, Olivia nodded. What should we try next? Jeff consulted the park map. Shall we go for the pirate ship ride? Olivia looked at the map and said concerned. The pirate ship ride included a water-based adventure, and she feared Jeff's nice outfit would get wet. She recalled that it involved some form of rafting. Although not as thrilling as the one at the water park, it could still result in soaked clothes. How about the Sky High ride instead? Olivia pointed to the long line on the left. If we get in line now, it'll take about an hour, right? If you want to go, let's line up. Jeff agreed, nodding. I'd like to experience it too. All right. Olivia smiled and proceeded to join the line. As they waited, they engaged in conversation, discussing various interesting topics. The long line became more bearable. When Olivia and Jeff reached the middle of the line, Vera pulled Chris to the end of the same line, not realizing who stood just a hundred feet in front of them. Chris, I've been wanting to try this ride for a long time. Come and join me. Chris observed the excited visitors strapped into their seats and shouting with exhilaration. The noise was starting to irritate him. 
It was just too chaotic and crowded here, and Chris didn't love children crying and shouting constantly. He much preferred resorts and lounging around expensive penthouses and members-only clubs where there were rules of conduct. Chris, we came to the amusement park to have fun. You should at least smile, Vera teased. I'm smiling, Chris replied, his arms spread wide. You're not smiling at all. You don't have to pretend, you know. Or, are you just disappointed that your little wildcat didn't accompany you on your birthday? Where is Olivia, by the way? I'm not worried about her, Chris responded, averting his eyes. Mm-hmm, Vera murmured, coyly licking her lips. I bet. The two of them continued to wait in line. When it was finally their turn, just as Chris was about to sit down on the chair, he noticed Olivia walking towards the amusement park's dining area, laughing and talking with another man. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. The loudspeaker repeated. Please place your phone and glasses in your pockets. High heels and sandals are not allowed. Olivia? Chris narrowed his eyes. He was stunned. What? Vera was taken aback. Your little wildcat? Yes. Chris quickly unfastened his seatbelt and stood up. I'm going to find her. Wait, Chris, we've been waiting in line for an hour. Vera protested. We can look for her after we finish this ride. No, you go ahead and continue. I'm not interested anymore, Chris said, making his way towards the exit. Hey, Chris, hey! Vera tried to undo her seatbelt, but it was too late. The safety device had already locked her in place. Excuse me, can you please help me unfasten this? She asked a staff member. I've changed my mind and I don't want to ride anymore. Sorry, the staff member apologized, spreading his hands helplessly. Shit, Vera murmured, watching as Chris walked away. Suddenly, the roller coaster ascended. Ah! About a hundred yards away, Olivia took a sip of the frozen lemonade slushies Jeff had just bought for the unseasonably warm day. What do you feel like having for lunch? What do you feel like? Jeff asked. Anything is fine. Olivia looked around. If we're planning to try some thrilling rides in the afternoon, we should avoid fast food and fried food. How old are you? Jeff suddenly interrupted their conversation. Me? I'm 16. Olivia replied, holding her cup and looking curiously at Jeff. Why do you ask? Didn't Jeff know she was 16? There's something very peculiar, Jeff said his gaze penetrating as he looked at Olivia. Although I've only been studying psychology for six months, I've been working in the field of adolescent psychology for five years. And? Olivia didn't understand what Jeff was getting at. You may be 16, but all your psychological indicators point to an adult around 25, Jeff stated, his eyes narrowing as if he could see through Olivia. This is unprecedented in my years of psychology research, it has never happened before. Olivia's heart seemed to skip a beat. I died at 25 in my last life, she thought. Nobody's ever come this close to seeing the real me, though. She glanced at Jeff's expression, and he raised the corner of his mouth. Science doesn't lie, he said, as if knowing her secret. The surroundings were still noisy, but Olivia, holding her cup, remained unusually quiet. She knew she couldn't lie. Any expression or action could give her away. After all, Jeff was an expert in the field. Thinking this, she became calmer. Olivia smirked mischievously. What if there are things that science can't explain? That's what interests me, Jeff replied, staring at Olivia. He felt that this would be a fascinating research subject. Olivia remained silent, also looking at Jeff. The two stood face to face neither of them speaking. At that moment, Olivia's phone rang. She glanced at Jeff and then answered the call. Hello? Where are you? Chris's voice came from the other end of the line. At the amusement park, Olivia replied. Who are you with? Chris asked. My tutor? 
Olivia answered. Your tutor? Chris repeated. Yes? Olivia found Chris's interrogation amusing. What's the matter? Are you checking up on me? Where are you? I'm right behind you. Chris replied. After hanging up the phone, Olivia turned around. She wasn't as surprised as before. It seemed that Chris had a habit of following her and turning up behind her at odd times. However, Chris's appearance at that moment was quite timely. It got her out of answering Jeff Dreyer's questions, at least. Chris approached Olivia and glanced at Jeff. Hello, Jeff greeted him, recognizing Chris from his family's business dealings. He extended his hand for a handshake. I'm Jeff Dreyer, I'm Liv's tutor. Hello, Chris shook his hand, I'm Chris. I've heard a lot about you, Jeff smiled. After they let go of each other's hands, Jeff asked, Did you come here alone, Chris? I came with a friend, Chris replied. Oh, Jeff nodded. Liv and I were going to have lunch together. If you and your friend are interested, why not join us? Okay, Chris agreed, nodding. She'll be here later. Olivia looked at Jeff and then at Chris as Jeff led the way to the nearest food court. She couldn't help but feel a hint of tension between them. Maybe it was just her imagination. They found a decent family restaurant and sat down. Just as they were about to order their food, Vera hurriedly arrived. She had received a message from Chris and rushed over. Vera, dressed in yet another fiery red dress, exuded a captivating allure. Despite her slightly disheveled hair and a trace of anger on her brow after Chris left her on the ride, her beauty couldn't be suppressed. She sat down next to Olivia and smiled at her. Their meal was awkward and surprisingly quiet since this was an odd group. Vera made an excuse to leave first, and Jeff also took his leave, citing some research papers he had to begin outlining back at his office. Both he and Vera could sense an unspoken attraction between Chris and Olivia, so they wanted to let the two youngsters have the rest of the day to themselves without further interruption. Only Chris and Olivia were left, gazing at each other. After a while, Olivia broke the silence and asked, What do you want to do? Um... Chris didn't have a specific plan in mind, but upon hearing Olivia's question, he thought for a moment and replied, What do you want to do? Olivia glanced at the map that Jeff had left behind and suggested, How about riding the carousel? Having just finished eating, she felt that it wouldn't be suitable to indulge in overly thrilling rides with big dips or multiple loops. Okay, Chris nodded in agreement. As they walked towards the carousel, there weren't many people waiting in line. Most of them were children. Within 15 minutes, they were riding side by side on the carousel. Olivia looked at Chris's horse. Why is yours a horse? Mine is a deer. Chris raised the corner of his mouth. Maybe it's because the two of you resemble each other. You really need to get your eyes checked. Olivia glanced at Chris with a teasing smile. As the music played, the carousel started to spin. The children gleefully enjoyed the ride. Chris, however, didn't feel the same excitement. He just turned to look at Olivia, who seemed to be enjoying herself. It appeared that many girls liked riding the carousel. Vera had mentioned wanting to ride it too. After three rounds, the ride came to an end. Chris seized the opportunity to ask his own question. Do you really like carousels? Not particularly. Olivia stretched her back. She had finished digesting her food and was ready to move on to something else. But many girls do. Why? Chris couldn't understand the joy derived from such a simple ride. Well, I've heard a saying before. In your eyes, the carousel goes around in the same place, but in my eyes, the whole world revolves around me. Olivia speculated. I'm not sure if that's the reason. Upon hearing this, Chris smiled. What do you want to do next? He asked. Curious to see what his funny little wildcat would choose. The roller coaster or the Ferris wheel? Let's go on the roller coaster. Olivia's eyes lit up. The one in this amusement park is a vertical drop. It's doubly thrilling. Chris was momentarily taken aback. This choice seemed different from what he had anticipated. The two of them joined the line for the roller coaster. Not far away, two people, a man and a woman, in disguises were carefully following them secretly taking photos along the way. Pointing the camera at Olivia, the woman snapped two consecutive photos. 
Satisfied, she nodded. They're moving. Let's catch up quickly. Miss, this isn't a good idea. The man trailing behind the photographer, wearing a mask and a hat, voiced his concerns. He felt a bit uneasy. If you know who finds out, he'll surely be angry. Look at how timid you are. The photographer, Devin, rolled her eyes. I'm just doing what needs to be done. Don't say anything, Albert. Just be careful not to get caught. Albert remained silent. He never expected that when he reported his initial findings about Olivia and Chris to Devin, that she would sneakily follow him all the way here. At this moment, Albert was unsure if his actions were right or wrong. Ah, this is a great photo, Devin said, taking another picture of Olivia. Unlike Albert, Devin seemed to be enjoying herself. I knew my brother Jeremy wouldn't have bad taste. Just as it was time for another round of covert photography, Devin gestured to Albert to get closer. So this is the famous Olivia, she whispered. Hmm? Olivia tilted her head, thinking she heard something saying, or thinking, her name. She looked around confused but didn't see anyone because Devin and Albert had ducked behind a pillar. What's wrong? Chris asked. Nothing. Olivia shook her head. Probably just the amusement park staff or someone calling for one of their kids or something. Thought I heard my name. Ooh, we're up, Chris said, looking ahead and saying they were next in line for the roller coaster they'd been waiting to go on. Okay, Olivia nodded. It had been a while since she had enjoyed herself carefreely like this. Observing the smile on Olivia's face, Chris felt, for the first time, that the amusement park wasn't as dull as he'd initially thought. They continued enjoying the attractions until the sun went down, relishing in the diverse array of experiences it had to offer. First, they embarked on a thrilling roller coaster ride called Twisted Fury, their screams of excitement merging with the wind as they soared through loops and hairpin turns, feeling an exhilarating rush of adrenaline. Next, they explored the whimsical world of Fantasia Gardens, an enchanting garden filled with vibrant flowers, sparkling fountains, and intricate tabaris that resembled beloved characters from classic fairy tales. They marveled at the breathtaking display of nature's beauty and took whimsical pictures amidst the enchanting backdrop. Seeking a change of pace, they ventured into the haunted manor, an eerie and captivating dark ride that transported them through a haunted house filled with spooky illusions and ghostly apparitions. Their hearts raced as they navigated the twists and turns, feeling a delightful shiver run down their spines. Finally, they immersed themselves in the mesmerizing Aqua Spectacle Water Show, where talented performers showcased their synchronized swimming skills, accompanied by a dazzling display of water jets, colored lights, and captivating music. They watched in awe as the performers moved gracefully through the water, creating a spectacle that left them in a state of wonder. When they left the performance, they looked around and realized the park's closing time neared. The park will be closing in 30 minutes. A man announced on the PA system. Please gather your belongings and proceed to the exits in an orderly fashion. Fireworks will be displayed in five minutes. We hope you had a wonderful time at Six Flowers Amusement Park today. Thank you, and we look forward to your next visit. Let's go. I'll drop you off, Chris offered his hands in his pockets. No need, I'll call Morris to pick me up. Olivia waved her hand. You also need to call Sven to pick you up, right? The two of them joined the flow of people leaving the amusement park. Olivia stopped in her tracks, seemingly remembering something. She turned to Chris and said, Oh, by the way. Hmm? Chris also halted and looked at her. What is it? Happy birthday. Olivia smiled and said, even though I didn't prepare a birthday present for you. At that moment, all the lights in the amusement park went dark. Then fireworks erupted in the night sky with a resounding whoosh. Ah, fireworks, look at the fireworks. The children became excited at the sight. Just as the spectacle unfolded, a young boy ran into Olivia, causing Chris to swiftly grab her waist. Be careful, he said, pulling her back. In that moment, he caught a glimpse of the slight panic in her eyes. With a smirk, Chris leaned in and kissed her cheek. The touch of his lips left Olivia momentarily electrified. She looked up at Chris. Bathed in the glow of the fireworks, 
He smiled mischievously. His gaze filled with the sense of mischief. He mouthed the words, The gift? I received it. Olivia sat up in bed, tossing and turning, unable to sleep. She scratched her head, feeling frustrated with the lingering question that kept her awake. It seemed trivial, but it bothered her nonetheless. Should she consider Chris's cheek kiss as merely a courteous gesture or harmless flirtation? Or was it something more? Was there something much, much deeper developing between them? But then she wondered, could someone really ask for a simple little cheek kiss as a birthday present? It felt strange and out of the ordinary. Olivia couldn't shake off the feeling of unease that it brought. She decided to get out of bed and look out the window at the morning sky. She ran her hand through her hair, trying to clear her mind. She scolded herself for losing sleep over such a trivial matter. She had more important things to worry about, especially regarding Jeff. Revealing her rebirth to anyone, especially Jeff, was out of the question. She shuddered at the thought of being subjected to experiments and tests. The mere idea was terrifying. What if he somehow knows I'm not merely a teenage girl? That I've lived as an adult before coming back to this form? She shook her head. No. No, there's no possible way he could know any of that. To anyone else, that would seem insane. Shaking off those thoughts, Olivia resolved to focus on her upcoming school day. She couldn't let these trivial matters distract her from her studies. I need to go to school, she reminded herself. With that, she quickly got ready and headed out, her small leather bag in tow. She had temporarily stopped carrying it after sending it for maintenance. She had heard that using a leather bag during winter could make the skin rough. She cherished that bag and took good care of it. At breakfast in the dining room, Michael was already present. Are you off to school today? He asked. Yep, Olivia replied with a smile. Ah, I see. Michael nodded. Take care then. Have a good day, Dad, Olivia responded. Has Grandpa woken up? I think he's still asleep, Michael said. He's leaving for London in two days and won't be back until much later in the year. Grandpa seems to be very busy, Olivia remarked, noticing her grandfather's absence at home. Yes, Michael nodded with a tinge of sadness in his eyes. Although the company your grandpa started, Johnson's Foods, is headquartered in New York City, we have branches in the UK as well, especially in London. It's actually bigger than the headquarters in New York City. Your uncle is usually in charge of that location. We have branches in London? Olivia was taken aback. She had no knowledge of this. Yes, Michael confirmed. There was a hint of melancholy in his voice. That's interesting to know, Olivia said before checking her watch. I should head out, but I love you, she waved, bidding her father farewell. After leaving the Johnson Mansion and heading to Marshall High School, Olivia was stopped at the school gate. The long-haired girl who halted her looked her up and down, so Olivia asked, Can I help you? Which class are you in? The girl inquired her gaze fixated on Olivia's school bag. There was a trace of resentment in her eyes, and she could tell she was thinking about how easily she could snatch her bag from her. What does that have to do with you? Why are you into my class schedule, creep? Olivia responded, sensing that the person had ill intentions. Hey, who do you think you're talking to? I'm a senior, have some respect, the girl exclaimed angrily. She scrutinized Olivia from head to toe, feeling a sense of familiarity. Aren't you the campus model from the Climate Initiative Gala? She had seen Olivia's photo, so she recognized her instantly. Olivia finally looked more closely at the long-haired girl who had stopped her. She wore her ponytail high on her head and dressed in casual sportswear. She had a lean figure and handsome features. Based on her memories from her previous life, Olivia identified the girl as Christine Bonacci a girl's soccer team captain and member of the senior class. She came from a prestigious family with ties to old money. Christine was always seen around campus with the student body's senior vice president, Danielle Kenny. Why would she suddenly single Olivia out? Which class do you have the first period? 
Christine inquired once again. What does it matter to you? Olivia retorted, looking directly at Christine. Hey, why are you speaking to me that way? The long-haired girl grew furious. Did this junior not realize how arrogant she was being? Christine furrowed her brows and glanced at Olivia's school bag. A few days ago, Danielle had expressed her dislike for the bag and wanted it destroyed. Olivia saw Christine's thoughts and mused privately. So that's who's behind this sudden shakedown. Olivia wanted to use her powers, but just when she began to muster them up, a group of seniors rounded the corner and entered the school gates. Christine! One shouted. They were other girls from the soccer team. Hey, girl! Olivia knew she couldn't use her powers in front of anyone because she wasn't concentrating hard enough and didn't want to hurt anyone else. But she vowed to teach Christine a lesson if she ever got in her way or bothered her again. She, and her friend Danielle too, apparently. So when Christine was distracted by her teammates, Olivia used the opportunity to head into her class building. Are all junior students as arrogant as that girl? Christine asked one of her fellow soccer players when she realized Olivia was already heading inside. Who, Olivia? Another senior said. Wasn't she the campus model or whatever? Maybe that's why she's arrogant. The girl beside Christine chimed in. Do you all know her? Christine asked her teammates. I don't know her personally, but she's been quite popular in school recently. She's the junior class president. One of them replied. So it's the same person. Christine muttered to herself. Christine turned around and headed towards her classroom as the first bell rang. The girl carrying the bag Danielle hates is the same person who's close to that Chris guy that stupid Drew Benke wants to be in the student union. Christine had to inform Danielle about this matter. Christine didn't like Olivia's attitude and didn't want her to get too cocky without being knocked down a peg. Inside the Arts and Letters building, Olivia had just entered the classroom and set her bag down when Adam called her to his desk. Resting his hands on the edge of the desk, she approached Adam, curious about the reason for being summoned. Hey, Adam, did you need something? Yeah, listen, I just want to thank you for taking care of the class bonding event over the winter break. Adam began. It showed real leadership and apparently everyone had fun. No problem, Olivia smiled. Mostly it was Sam Feinstein who organized it, but Olivia just smiled anyway. As she walked back to her seat, she encountered Pamela, who was lingering near the door. Pamela, are you addicted to eavesdropping? What? What are you talking about? Pamela blinked innocently. She had seen Adam calling Olivia over to his desk and had secretly eavesdropped, but she couldn't be blamed entirely. After all, Adam had been treating Olivia so favorably this year. What if he planned to show her special treatment or help her cheat? Pamela had to keep an eye on him. Passing by, are you? Olivia asked, amused. Yes, I was just sharpening my pencil. Pamela forced herself to stay calm, puffing out her chest. What's the matter? Nobody uses pencils anymore. We use our laptops. Do you just suddenly not like technology? Or are you just bored and need to focus on other people's lives because yours is so lame? Olivia smirked. I... I... Pamela rolled her eyes and retorted. Can't I wait over here to talk to Adam? If you can go to him, why can't I? Mm -hmm. Olivia sneered, pushing past Pamela, before she turned and said to Adam, Adam, Pamela happened to be passing by and came to find you. Adam glanced at Pamela and realized what was happening. Suppressing his displeasure, he asked, Pamela, what can I do for you? I... Pamela bit her lower lip. What reason could she give for approaching Adam? Damn it, now she was on the spot and it was all because of Olivia. Come over and talk to me. Adam motioned for her to come closer to his desk. He believed in treating all students fairly, regardless of their academic standing. However, he couldn't deny that character played a role. And since Pamela was clearly sometimes difficult, he was weary of her. But he knows that these children would face difficult studies and the college entrance exams, a critical turning point in their lives. Adam worried that if he said the wrong thing, it could affect Pamela's attitude and dedication to her studies. So far, 
Pamela had been diligent in her academic pursuits. All right, Pamela replied, suppressing her frustration. How could she have nothing to ask? It was all because of that annoying Olivia. Meanwhile, in the senior student classrooms, Christine found her friend Danielle. From the moment they met, Christine was instantly drawn to Danielle's infectious enthusiasm for learning, her unwavering determination, and her ability to effortlessly navigate through any challenge. Danielle's intellect and grace inspired Christine to strive for greatness, igniting a deep desire within her to emulate Danielle's every success. From academic pursuits to extracurricular activities, Christine looked up to Danielle as a role model, cherishing their friendship and yearning to acquire the same qualities that made Danielle so remarkable. Today, Danielle exuded confidence in her attire, donning a chic coat over her uniform that showcased her unique sense of style. Delicate silver bangles adorned her waist, their gentle jingles harmonizing with every movement, while a pendant necklace, intricately crafted with a mesmerizing sapphire, gracefully adorned her neck. Danielle's lustrous mane cascaded down her back, its rich chestnut hue catching the light with every sway, accentuating the subtle highlights that danced amidst the waves. Her facial features were a testament to her natural beauty, with captivating eyes that held a spark of curiosity and intelligence. Christine couldn't help but admire her beauty and perfect style, and almost forgot she had come here to tell her something. I saw that bag you wanted the other day, Christine told Danielle. The one you don't like? It belongs to that junior, Olivia Johnson. She was the campus model. She's really cocky. She seems to really think she's special around here. Probably because she won the photo competition. I guess she's also the junior class president too. Pretty and popular. Danielle didn't like to hear this. She liked being the most popular talked about well-rounded girl in school. She puffed up her cheeks in annoyance. I hate her, she declared, venting her frustrations. Christine made a mental note and assured Danielle, I'll take care of it. I'll arrange for someone to handle the situation with Olivia's bag. Christine promised her friend Danielle, hoping to elicit some praise from her friend. It's not just the bag, Danielle added, rolling her eyes. Even her hair quality is better than mine. It's infuriating. Displeased, Danielle puffed up her cheeks once again, expressing her frustration. Don't focus on her. Let me focus on her. You already have enough schoolwork coming up soon, and dealing with the junior year students can be quite annoying with your workload. You're right, Danielle concurred, sharing her sentiments. She found the excessive assignments at Marshall High burdensome, and looked forward to college. Don't worry, Christine assured her. I promise you, I'll make sure you don't have to worry about Olivia Johnson. As Olivia returned home from school, she couldn't help but feel anxious about the impending interaction with Jeff Dreyer. She felt like he had seen right into her, and it unsettled her. Miss, we have arrived home, the driver Morris announced. But Olivia remained in the car, lost in thought. Morris gently reminded her to get out of the car. Hmm? Olivia snapped back to reality and nodded. Oh, sorry, okay. Stepping into the living room, she spotted Jeff already waiting on the sofa, accompanied by Rachel and Monica. Rachel had her right hand wrapped in bandages and was seeking Jeff's advice on a book she held in her left hand. Jeff, you are amazing. This question has troubled me for a long time, Monica exclaimed with a smile. She was well aware that Jeff was her sister's tutor. She couldn't help but wonder why Olivia, who seemed like an incompetent student, managed to receive such special treatment. Monica, you should learn from Jeff, Rachel chimed in, her eyes lighting up. His academic achievements are remarkable. In that case, Jeff, can I ask you for help if I have any homework questions I can't figure out? Monica tilted her head, widening her eyes, trying to appear docile. Jeff hadn't slept a wink the previous night and arrived half an hour earlier than usual. Little did he expect to be pestered by Monica as soon as he had arrived. He couldn't refuse her request, although his mind was somewhere else while going over her homework question with her. 
shouldn't you be asking your teachers at school? Olivia interjected with a cold smile. Rachel and Monica's attempts to poach were not going unnoticed. Good afternoon, Jeff. Good afternoon, Jeff greeted back, his eyes also lighting up upon seeing Olivia. Sister, how can you treat me like this? Monica displayed a mix of joy and grievance, her eyes fixed on Olivia while directing her words toward Jeff. You should continue, Olivia shrugged, addressing the maid standing nearby. Please bring a plate of fruit to my room later. Yes, miss, the maid acknowledged. I'll go to my room, Olivia said, turning around and leaving. Wait a minute. Jeff stood up and nodded to Rachel and Monica. I'll see you later. He followed Olivia, leaving behind Rachel and Monica, whose eyes were filled with hatred. They despised Olivia for interfering with their plans and Jeff for not recognizing their true worth. Entering Olivia's room, Jeff asked her to take out her homework as usual. He selected a few question types for her to tackle first, allowing her to attempt them before providing his commentary. He delved deeper into the subject matter, offering detailed explanations and insights. Today's focus was Spanish, and Jeff's proficiency in the language made it a pleasant experience. They conversed in Spanish for the next hour, with Jeff believing that employing the language directly would aid Olivia's memorization of the otherwise mundane material. After correcting two mistakes in Olivia's past tense usage, the tutoring session concluded for the day. Jeff pushed the textbook aside and finally broached the main topic that had been on his mind before they got started with tutoring. So, you know, I've been thinking about it since the other day. I've been studying the adolescent brain and behavior for my thesis, and I can't figure out what it is that makes you seem like... like such an old soul, Olivia, he inquired. Olivia took a deep breath, knowing that this moment would arrive sooner or later. There are many things that cannot be explained by modern science. Yes, Jeff said, carefully observing Olivia's expression. That's why I'm curious. I won't be able to give you a precise explanation because even I don't fully understand it, Olivia admitted with a shrug. I know, Jeff nodded. He could sense that Olivia's expression was sincere. Olivia understood that her 16-year-old body housed the soul of a person in her 20s, and she didn't dare underestimate his intellect. While Jeff had been reading her expression, Olivia had been reading his thoughts. He knew there was something special about her, even if he couldn't pinpoint what it was. They smiled at each other, feeling their connection deepen. Once Jeff left, Olivia made her way to the dining table, where the servants were preparing a meal. She sat down and began enjoying it in solitude. With Grandpa Jack absent from home, she was the only one present at the table, free to eat as she pleased. Her father, meanwhile, had left the mansion and drove southward. The entire time, he couldn't shake off the increasing annoyance he felt. Lost in his thoughts, he found himself unknowingly arriving at the entrance of the hospital back in Manhattan. What's happening to me? Michael wondered, staring at the city hospital in a daze. What had he been expecting? What had he been thinking? Letting out a long sigh, he muttered, I'm truly lost. A car honked behind him, bringing him back to reality. Glancing in the rear view mirror, he started the car again. Before driving home, he headed toward Olivia's school. Then he drove to the neighborhood adjacent to it and drove around for a while. Then he noticed a figure on the opposite side of the street. As if compelled by an unseen force, Michael turned his car around at the intersection and drove toward the bus stop across the road. Lowering his window, he said, Get in the car. Huh? Victoria was taken aback upon seeing Michael. Why was he here? What was he doing? I told you to get in the car. Michael frowned his mind in disarray, not wanting to explain further. Desiree, who was a few steps behind Victoria, admiring a garden they were passing, suddenly glanced up at Michael and then at Victoria. She smiled. Is this Liv's father? He looks like her. Yes, Victoria confirmed. Who knows what he's up to? He asked you to get in the car, Michael interjected, his furrowed brows deepening. He really had gone crazy. Please get into the car. 
Desiree urged, concerned about the doctor's instructions for Victoria to be cautious that day. They had already been walking around the neighborhood for a while, and maybe that had been a little too strenuous after Victoria's surgery. I'll meet you back home if he takes you the last few blocks, Desiree assured her. You sure? Victoria asked. Yes, I love walking. Besides, it seems he may need to talk to you. Victoria overheard Desiree's reasoning and complied, opening the back door and settling herself inside the vehicle. You can join us too, Victoria offered, gesturing to Desiree. No, no, no. Desiree waved her hand, a sudden realization prompting her to change her plans. I just remembered that I have an errand to run elsewhere. You two go ahead and I'll see you back at home. With a smile, Desiree began to turn. Desiree! Victoria wondered if she should get back out of the car. However, before Victoria could make her exit, Michael swiftly stepped on the accelerator, preventing her from leaving. The luxury car demonstrated exceptional performance, its powerful engine propelling them forward while maintaining remarkable stability. Victoria, taken aback by the unexpected acceleration, found herself at a loss for words. Stop the car, I want to get off, she exclaimed. Observing Victoria through the rearview mirror, Michael couldn't help but raise the corners of his mouth. I'll take you home, he insisted. I don't need you to drive me home, I want to get out of the car, Victoria retorted, her gaze fixed on Michael. I won't let you get out, Michael firmly said. You, you're truly... Victoria's frustration grew, and after contemplating for a while, she finally scolded him. You're being unreasonable. Please just stay in your seat, Michael responded, his demeanor becoming more relaxed. By the way, have you had anything to eat? Yes, I have, Victoria replied, her face turning red as her stomach growled. She couldn't blame herself for blushing when she hadn't even had a chance to drink water after work. It was her last day for a checkup, and she'd asked Desiree to accompany her. Needless to say, she hadn't had time to eat. Michael chuckled. Let me treat you to a meal. No need. Victoria turned her head and declined. I don't need your treat. I want to get out of the car. Her stomach growled again, betraying her true desires. Michael laughed once more. You say you're not hungry, but your stomach keeps giving you away and revealing the truth. Victoria's face turned even redder. She muttered and scolded. Honestly, the older you get, the more inappropriate you become. Maybe, but you're hungry, so come on. Michael insisted on taking Victoria to have dinner. Considering Victoria's still recovering health, they opted for a yummy nutritional stew that would benefit her body. Although Michael wished to treat her, Victoria insisted on splitting the bill evenly. After handing over the money for her meal, she disregarded Michael. Michael couldn't help but feel both amused and exasperated. As he dropped Victoria off at the entrance of her community, she didn't twist her body this time and instead thanked him before turning around and leaving. Michael gazed at her retreating figure for a long time, sighing before finally driving home. On the journey, Michael found himself questioning his own actions. Was he beyond redemption? The way he kept coming to see Victoria? He shook his head as his house came into view. Three weeks passed, and Olivia immersed herself in her schoolwork, diligently reviewing her subjects one by one. Monica, meanwhile, went through four different tutors in that same time span. It wasn't that she disliked the tutor's poor instructional skills. Rather, they just weren't chef. And Rachel indulged her every whim by firing each one she rejected. Olivia observed the situation with a sneer in her eyes, seen through the intentions of her stepmother and half-sister. Did they truly wish for Jeff to become Monica's tutor? Meanwhile, Chris had grown tired of witnessing Olivia and Jeff's private time every Sunday. So on the third Sunday, when he called Olivia and she was with Jeff yet again, he finally exploded upon hanging up. Vera, if I recall correctly, you were a top student in high school and college, right? Yes, Vera replied, lying on the sofa and flipping through fashion magazines while wearing a face mask. What's the matter? Do you have any questions you need help with? Do you want a part-time job? Chris raised an eyebrow. Are you interested in becoming a tutor for Wildcats? 
Does Olivia need a tutor? Vera shifted her gaze from the magazine to Chris and asked, Yes, Chris affirmed. She will, once her current one goes away. In that case, sure. Let her know she can contact me. Just tell me the time and place, Vera replied, looking back at the magazine. She would do anything to look after her younger cousin. All right, Chris smiled and nodded, then went back to his room. He called Michael and informed him that his friend was interested in finding a tutoring job. He also provided Vera's resume. Actually, we do need a tutor over here, Michael said, appreciating the offer. Tell her to come at 4.30 in the afternoon, the day after tomorrow. Thank you, sir, Chris expressed before ending the call. Michael sighed heavily after hanging up, feeling conflicted about the friend Chris had recommended. While Vera possessed knowledge, he hoped she would satisfy Monica. His youngest daughter had grown incredibly indulged, changing tutors four times in just three weeks. It gave him a headache. If this arrangement didn't work out, he might lose interest in intervening any further. With Monica's new tutor finally arranged, Michael tasked Ansel Barr with finding another tutor for Olivia, since Jeff would be returning to school soon to resume his studies. And Olivia was also facing more exams the following week. Michael witnessed her efforts and wished to assist her as much as possible. Knowing that he was searching for a tutor for Olivia, Ansel Barr took great care in his selection process. He spared no expense and invited the most renowned tutors in New York City. On the following Sunday afternoon, Olivia went to the airport to see Jeff off. It's quite amusing, isn't it? My dad and mom couldn't make it, yet you came? Jeff remarked with a smile. They can't afford to neglect their duties. Olivia responded with a smile. What's the matter? Am I not qualified to bid you farewell? Of course you are, Jeff playfully reminded her. You've been working so hard during this period, so I'm sure you'll achieve excellent results in your classes this semester. I sure hope to excel. After all, I am Jeff Dreyer's student. Olivia exclaimed with a smile. Oh, come on, Jeff teased. You have a way with words. Are you trying to make me blush? Huh. Olivia joined in on the laughter. Their playful banter dispelled the somber cloud of departure. During their time together, they developed a deep friendship rooted in mutual admiration. Thank you, Jeff, for this month. Jeff smiled and nodded, expressing his gratitude. Thank you for your cooperation during this time. I'll send you a gift once I'm back at school. Wow, a gift too, Olivia exclaimed, her smile growing wider. I'll thank you in advance. You're welcome. Jeff reached out and patted Olivia's shoulder. Anyway, guess I should be on my way. Jeff waved his hand and headed towards the TSA security line. Despite knowing they were about to part ways, Olivia couldn't help but feel a tinge of disappointment. She could only hope for their next encounter. Upon returning home from school, Olivia wondered who her new tutor would be. She couldn't help but feel a twinge of nostalgia for Jeff a capable tutor whom she deeply respected. Stepping out of the car at the entrance of the Johnson Mansion, Olivia sighed, fully aware of the impending National Elite Student Competition and the need to apply herself in school more generally. As she entered the living room, her eyes fell upon a familiar figure seated on the sofa. Vera? Yep, Vera replied, waving her hand. Long time no see, Miss Johnson. Not too long, actually. Olivia recalled their encounter at the amusement park three weeks prior. Blushing at the memory, she swiftly pushed the embarrassment aside. Are you here as a guest today? Liv, do you know each other? Michael inquired, observing his daughter closely. This is your new tutor. Huh? Olivia was taken aback. Did Vera really come here to tutor her? Vera playfully blinked her eyes. I was temporarily appointed. Well, in that case, I'm honored. Olivia smiled, extending an invitation. Come to my room. Okay, Vera agreed, rising from the sofa and smiling at Michael and Rachel before following Olivia upstairs. I'm quite curious about your room. Huh, don't get your hopes up. You might be disappointed, Olivia quipped, 
aware that her room held nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, it was rather drab and damp. Michael watched them, feeling a sense of satisfaction as they chatted and laughed. Undoubtedly, Olivia was the child who troubled him the least. Rachel, on the other hand, couldn't help but feel puzzled. What was going on with Olivia? How did she accept her tutors so readily? Rachel's unease grew, suspecting that maybe Vera possessed an extraordinary background. Honey, where did you find Vera? As a tutor, I mean. Vera, Michael began to explain. But before he could finish, Ansel Parr led the tutor who had been invited for Monica into the room. The man appeared to be in his 50s, of average height, wearing glasses and a suit. Though not young, his eyes shone with brightness and a clear sign of his expertise as an educator. Sir, I've invited Mr. John Kong, Ansel Parr introduced. Oh, hello, Mr. Kong, Michael greeted, rising from his seat. He had learned from Ansel Parr that John Kong was a former retired teacher and now the most esteemed tutor in New York City, notoriously difficult to secure. The hefty sum spent to hire him should surely satisfy Monica. Ansel Parr, please bring Mr. Kong to Miss Monica's room. She's already working on her homework. Miss Monica? Ansel Parr hesitated briefly, quickly regaining his composure. He knew how difficult Monica was and how many tutors she had already gone through. He nodded and said, This way, Mr. Kong. Very well, Mr. Kong acknowledged, following Ansel upstairs. Wait, Rachel was bewildered. What was happening? She glanced at Michael, seeking clarification. Honey, where is Jeff Dreyer? Wasn't he supposed to be Liv's tutor? Jeff, Michael responded, went back to school overseas. What? Rachel stood up alarmed. He left? Yes, Michael confirmed. He departed yesterday. Liv even went to the airport to bid him farewell. This... Rachel was taken aback, turning her gaze towards Monica's room. Without delay, a shriek echoed from within, causing her heart to skip a beat. Subsequently, Monica rushed downstairs, questioning, Where's Jeff? She had been eagerly anticipating Jeff's arrival only to be met with an elderly man. Jeff returned to school, Michael replied. This is the tutor we hired for you. You can address him as Mr. Kong. I don't want to, Monica instinctively protested. Father, why didn't you say anything when Jeff left? Why invite such an old-fashioned man? Just by looking at him, you can tell he's outdated. I doubt he can teach well. I only wanted Jeff to be my tutor. <sighs> Mr. Kong, who had hurried over, frowned and coldly snorted. If that's the case, I'll take my leave now. He strode out, uninterested in engaging with someone who had insulted him so easily as Monica had. He was a proud, seasoned scholar and would not tolerate such treatment from a student. He had his principles and would not earn money under these circumstances. Mr. Kong, wait. Ansel Parr hurriedly chased after him. I've been a teacher for 30 years, and this is the first time I've been treated like this. Mr. Kong declared, unyielding. I refuse to teach a Johnson family member ever again. Farewell. He departed without looking back. Kong! Ansel Parr lamented as he watched Mr. Kong's resolute departure. Inviting him had required substantial effort, but he hadn't anticipated Monica's audacity to drive him away so easily. Monica, this is already the fifth tutor. What is it you want? Michael's patience wore thin, exasperated by Monica's behavior. What was going on with her? I... Monica bit her lip in anger. She hadn't expected Jeff to return to school so soon. I told you before, I don't want an old tutor. Michael? Rachel intervened, attempting to mend the situation. Why don't we find a younger tutor for Monica? This time, Monica will definitely be more obedient. Vera seems like a good tutor as well. The more she pondered it, the more Rachel believed that Vera was no ordinary person. If Monica were to be under her tutelage, it might benefit her future greatly. Vera is already tutoring Liv. Michael shot Rachel a disapproving look, perplexed by her sudden suggestion. I... 
Rachel stumbled, unable to find a suitable response. This approach wouldn't work. After hesitating for a moment, Rachel realized that Michael was currently furious with Monica, so she advised Monica, Apologize to your father and don't act so stubborn in the future. Father, I'm sorry, Monica offered an apology, though she still felt aggrieved. Rachel had instructed her to temporarily relent. Eventually, Rachel would bring up the topic of hiring a tutor for her once more. Fine. Michael's train of thought was disrupted as he turned to Monica. Go back to your room. Mommy! Monica looked at Rachel and sought solace. Monica, go back to your room for now. Rachel conceded, aware that anything she said at the moment would only worsen the situation. But... Monica's eyes welled up with tears. Dad, how can you be so biased? Why did Olivia get the good tutor? After voicing her accusation, she ran back to her room in tears. Michael chuckled, amused by the accusation of bias. After all this time, she still dared to call him biased. It was rather comical. Sweetie, Rachel cut in, about to voice her thoughts before deciding against it. I'll, um go upstairs to check on Monica. Go ahead. Michael rubbed his temples wearily. His energy seemed to have been depleted. It always seemed to be around Monica. Dealing with her was so draining. After a while, he turned to Ansel. Ansel, what do you think? Am I biased? Yes. Ansel Parr nodded, confirming Michael's suspicion. Is that so? Michael forced a bitter smile. He believed that he treated Olivia quite well, fulfilling his duties as a father, and that he treated Monica just as well. You have indeed shown bias toward Miss Monica, Anselpar stated matter-of-factly. She has driven away five tutors, Anselpar continued, adjusting his glasses. And yet, you keep inviting more to help her, instead of punishing her. It's like you reward her. But if she drove away another tutor, would you invite more still? I... Michael muttered, not knowing the answer. That's why I said Miss Monica isn't very obedient. She knows you will just let her get away with it. But you must treat her as you would treat any other mature person and show her consequences. Ansel Parr, though having gone too far in telling his boss exactly what he thought of his spoiled daughter, couldn't bear to watch any longer. Ansel had invited Mr. Kong himself, and it was simply too much observing Monica storm off wronged and unjustly victimized. Ansel Parr's usually gentle temperament ignited a spark of anger seeing her insults the man Ansel had taken so much effort to find and bring here. I need some quiet time. Michael's thoughts were in disarray. Of course, Ansel agreed. Sir, I'll take my leave now. See you tomorrow. Turning away, Ansel departed the Johnson mansion. Left alone in the living room, Michael sank into deep contemplation. Two hours passed before he snapped out of his daze. Rachel brought Monica downstairs, the girl's tear-streaked face evidence of their discussion. Monica approached Michael slowly. Dad, please don't be angry with me. Although she still felt wronged, Rachel had assured her that in due time, Rachel would hire a suitable tutor for her. All right. Michael's thoughts were interrupted as he turned to Monica. Apology accepted. Honey, Rachel interjected, attempting to smooth things over. You know Monica is just a child with a quick temper, but it's because she's so close to you. Right, Michael nodded, but in actuality he was realizing that perhaps he wasn't as close to Monica as he thought. Did he really know her that well beyond her temper tantrums? Was that the reason for their strained relationship? At that moment, a car horn sounded outside. It's so late, who could it be? Rachel appeared toward the entrance. Michael and Monica also turned their attention to the door. A butler opened it, and soon Chris Jones entered, greeting them as he saw their curious gazes. Chris! Monica exclaimed in surprise. Why are you here? Chris, please have a seat. Michael smiled upon seeing Chris Jones entering his mansion. He knew Chris was here to pick up Vera with his driver, as they had arranged this previously. Vera was to arrive by Uber and leave with Chris. 
But Rachel watched completely ignorant to this, completely confused, thinking Chris had just stopped by unannounced to see Liv. That's odd, Rachel thought, and Michael seems to be okay with it too. Has Liv finished her tutoring? Chris asked, settling onto a sofa. Shall we have her and Vera come down for some coffee or tea maybe? Sure, Michael nodded. He knew Liv probably hadn't finished her studying, but he found it amusing how obviously much young Chris Jones liked his daughter, so he encouraged them to see each other. After all, it was good for business. Yes, sir, the maid replied to Chris, promptly ascending the stairs to fetch them. Shortly after, Olivia and Vera descended the staircase, engaged in animated conversation, evident by their laughter. The sight made Monica uncomfortable. A friend of Olivia is an enemy of mine, she thought. Apologies for the delay, Olivia smiled, acknowledging the tardiness. We got carried away with our conversation. Oh, wow, Chris, Vera greeted, waving her hand. Approaching them, she added, didn't expect to see you there. Are you here to see your fiancé? What do you think? Chris chuckled. Of course. It tickled him to see Vera and Olivia together, two women he thought fondly of. Reading Chris's mind, Liv herself couldn't help but smile. She liked this feeling of being admired and of fitting in somewhere. She didn't want it to go away. Monica and Rachel were astonished when they witnessed the conversation between Chris and Vera. They exchanged subtle glances, their minds filled with confusion. What was happening? How did Chris Jones know Olivia's tutor? Since you're all here, let's have dinner together, Michael suggested. Oh, I can't, I have plans. Vera waved her hand dismissively. She didn't love eating dinner with rich families she didn't know well. Too stuffy and proper. Chris, do you have something to discuss with Liv? Or are you just here to pick me up? If not, let's head out. All right, boss, Chris teased. Guess I won't be staying for dinner. Take care, Vera waved her hand at the Johnsons, ignoring her younger cousin. See you tomorrow, Olivia. Remember to complete the exercises I assigned. Yes, I'll do it after dinner, Olivia nodded. After bidding farewell, Vera and Chris left the Johnson mansion together. Rachel and her daughter were left completely dumbfounded by their departure. I'm so hungry, let's eat. Olivia skipped towards the dining table. Miss Olivia, don't forget to clean your hands. A maid presented a wet towel. Ah, oh, thank you. Olivia picked up the towel and wiped her hands before taking her seat. Let's eat. Michael called out to the stunned Rachel and her daughter. Uh, Rachel pulled Monica to the dining table. Just as they sat down, Rachel asked, Wait, Michael, where did you find that tutor, Vera? I didn't find her. Chris introduced her to me. He said he knew her and wanted her to be a tutor. Michael picked up his fork and knife and took a bite of the food. What? Monica's voice immediately grew louder. Chris recommended her? Monica began to worry. What if Monica made a bad impression on Vera earlier, thinking her just some dumb, poor tutor? and that Vera woman said negative things about her to the Jones family. Yes, he did. Michael nodded to his daughter. Monica stared at Olivia with jealousy. What ability did she have to make Chris personally introduce her to tutors and help her out whenever she needed? The more Monica thought about it, the angrier she became. She rolled her eyes and picked up her spoon to drink a few mouthfuls of French onion soup. But even if Chris recommended someone... Is it necessary for him to come and pick them up personally? Rachel couldn't shake the feeling that Vera wasn't simply a tutor. She has ulterior motives for coming here, Rachel thought. She's too close to Chris. What if he sent her here to spy on us? Yes. Michael also found it strange as he looked at Olivia. They're cousins, but live. Do they live together? Yes. Olivia put a piece of eggplant in her mouth and chewed it a few times before swallowing. She is Chris's older cousin. Ah, Michael said. Got it. Monica dropped the spoon in her hand into the bowl of French onion soup. What did you say? They're cousins? Vera is Chris's mother's sister's daughter. Quietly, disdainfully, she added, Or can you not comprehend that? 
Olivia looked at Monica's expression and found it amusing. It seemed that something interesting must have happened at home before she arrived tonight. Hearing Olivia's words, Monica felt a buzzing sound in her head as she tried to go over everything she said in front of Vera earlier. Had Monica said something she shouldn't have in Vera's presence? Had she thrown a tantrum? The words she uttered in anger were now a distant memory. There must have been something unpleasant, as her heart raced in an irregular rhythm. Her ears buzzed. That woman was actually Chris's cousin. Her throat felt dry, and Monica's whole body trembled. She realized she might have said something she shouldn't have. What should she do? Seeking help, she looked at Rachel, whose mind was also in disarray. Rachel placed her hand on the back of Monica's hand, signaling her not to panic as she quickly thought of a way to remedy the situation. Observing the expressions and interactions between the mother and daughter, Olivia curled up the corners of her mouth. She enjoyed seeing them courting their own demise. It was highly entertaining. Vera's cold regard made Monica believe that Olivia must have badmouthed her to Vera. Otherwise, why would Vera ignore her? Olivia knew that Monica was unhappy with her, but she couldn't be bothered. In fact, she loved it. At school, Olivia tightly gripped the table, her mind in a trance as she stared at the scene before her. The voices of other students grew distant, and an unsettling feeling washed over her. Liv... How did you do on the final exams last semester? They're going to let us know the class ranking soon, Wendy said, entering from the neighboring hall, carrying her school bag. Suddenly, she saw Olivia's pale face and sweaty forehead. Wendy was taken aback. Liv, what happened? Are you okay? I don't know. Olivia's voice trembled. Are you experiencing low blood sugar? Wendy guessed. Have some water first. I bought a drink today. Wendy quickly took out a half a bottle of Sprite from her school bag, opened it, and handed it to Olivia. Carbonated drinks are said to help relieve discomfort. Thank you. Olivia gratefully accepted the Sprite from Wendy and took a sip to calm herself. She did feel better, and the world around her returned to normal. Her hearing became clearer. She looked up at Wendy, who wore a concerned expression and smiled. You're a lifesaver. Wendy's anxiety subsided. I'm glad you're all right. You scared me. <laughs> Olivia chuckled. At that moment, Pamela appeared behind Olivia and Wendy. If you're just going to stand there, please move aside. Don't block the way for others. With so many paths to take, you insist on this one? Wendy looked at Pamela. Can't you see that Liv isn't feeling well? So, what am I supposed to do about it? Pamela rolled her eyes. Who knows if you're pretending to create trouble just to find an excuse for your poor grades. Pamela was confident she was going to rank high in her class once the class rankings came out. She had sacrificed sleep and even neglected her skin, all for the sake of outperforming Olivia in their final exams. She had to be in the National Elite Student Competition in order to make a name for herself. What did you say? Wendy's anger flared up. Pamela, don't go too far. Am I going too far? Pamela coldly snorted. You're the one blocking the way and still have the audacity to accuse others of doing something? Wendy wanted to call her out but was stopped by Olivia. Let her pass. Olivia, her headache subsiding, urged. Pamela's continuous arguments only intensified her throbbing temples. She urged Pamela to move on. Wendy heeded Olivia's words and stepped aside. Hmm. Pamela raised her chin haughtily and walked past them, heading towards the hall's exit. Look at her, Wendy exclaimed in frustration, so pompous. What are y'all talking about? Millie entered the scene carrying her school bag. I just saw Pamela, what happened? The usual, she came looking for a fight. She insisted I was blocking her way, Wendy snorted. She's really infuriating. Olivia recalled that in her previous life, Pamela ranked second overall in the English final exam. Since the first place was taken by Millie, Pamela had the opportunity to participate in the National Elite Competition. It was during that competition that Olivia first got to know that scumbag Mark DeLillo through Pamela. Millie rolled her eyes. Pamela has issues with her character. No matter how high her class ranking is, 
it won't amount to much if she continues being a mean girl her whole life. How dare she bully my friends? Pamela will be in big trouble before she leaves school today. Really? Wendy and Olivia exchanged glances and burst into laughter. How would I know? I just said that. Millie shrugged, and the three of them laughed together. Actually, that's not a bad idea, Olivia thought, scheming ways she could take Pamela out before she ever had to meet Mark DeLillo. Olivia couldn't find Pamela anywhere immediately after school got out. That's odd, she thought. Usually she's by her locker or trying to annoy people in the courtyard. What Olivia didn't realize, however, was that Pamela was busy nosing around the senior lockers, searching for Chris. Ever since Francis's family's 100th anniversary celebration, Pamela had believed that Chris had an interest in her. He looked at me, she thought, and he seemed like he was sort of smiling with his eyes, but he was too nervous to make a move in front of Olivia, probably since she was so aggressive. As a result of her theory, over the last few weeks, Pamela often engineered coincidental run-ins during her free time where she could bump into Chris or walk by home and feel his gaze on her and that subtle smile. But after waiting for so long without Chris approaching her, Pamela couldn't wait for him to make his move any longer. With no signs of him seeking her out, Pamela grew worried. If she didn't make a move now, the favorable impression she had built might fade away over time. Pamela was determined not to let that happen. She believed that if Chris already had a good impression of her, a single sentence from her would be enough to solidify their connection. So she wrote him a short letter, something to pique his interest. And then, when Pamela represented Marshall High School in the National Elite Student Competition, it would be hard for Chris not to completely fall for her. She refused to believe she couldn't win over the heir of the Jones family. With her mind made up, Pamela continued searching for Chris on campus. Then suddenly, she found him. He was exiting a nearby classroom in the senior locker hall. She immediately dashed over to him. At that moment, Olivia and her friends rounded a corner and made their way from the junior lockers toward the senior ones. After drinking Wendy's Sprite, Olivia was beginning to feel much better. As they walked out of the corridor and passed through the hall on the first floor, Wendy suddenly pointed towards the double doors. Hey, isn't that Chris over there? Millie looked at a person approaching Chris and said, Isn't that Pamela? Yes, why is she in such a rush? Wendy turned her attention to Pamela. Seeing Chris not far ahead, Pamela took out her handwritten love letter and walked over. The letter was simple, just a small poem she had copied with beautiful calligraphy. Pamela was confident that this unique gift would make Chris see her in a new light. He would think she was unique and deep and artistic. Pamela's heart raced and her breathing grew shallow. She didn't dare to raise her head and meet his gaze. She just showed him the folded piece of paper in her palm, waiting for him to accept it. Every second felt like an eternity. Pamela's limbs trembled and doubt started creeping in. Had she approached him too urgently or written something too sincere? Was she too nervous? She didn't want to leave a bad impression on Chris. I've liked you for a long time. Pamela summoned all her courage and declared, You don't need to give me an answer now. I just hope you can accept this letter. Silence fell upon their surroundings. Olivia and the others, who were within earshot now, stared wide-eyed at the scene unfolding before them. Pamela felt her heart pounding, her breath caught in her throat. She didn't dare to raise her head to see his expression. She simply wanted Chris to accept her letter. Each passing second felt excruciatingly long. Pamela felt as if time had slowed down. Finally, she mustered the courage to raise her head and reveal her most perfect smile to Chris. But before she could do so, a familiar and gruff voice sounded in front of her. Pamela? Pamela froze in her tracks her world shattering. How could this be? She raised her head and stared at the person before her as if she had seen a ghost. M Mr. Dick. Mr. Dickens' presence had caught Pamela completely off guard. 
She hadn't noticed his presence because she was so focused on Chris. She turned her head to the left and saw Chris standing beside Mr. Dickens, off to the side a little bit, looking at her. Pamela's mind went blank. She had only seen Chris in the hallway, but she hadn't noticed that Mr. Dickens was with him. In her nervousness, she had started looking down, unable to lock eyes with Chris, and she must have walked right up to Mr. Dickens. Seeing this, Chris assumed Pamela needed to talk to her teacher about something, so he stepped aside. And because her heart was pounding so loudly in her ears, she hadn't even noticed Chris was now standing way off to the side while she accidentally confessed her love for... for Mr. Dickens? Her reaction seemed delayed due to nervousness and embarrassment. Mr. Dickens shifted his gaze from the name on the envelope to Pamela's face and said, Do you... This is very inappropriate to give me this, Pamela. I am a teacher. Come with me to the office. Mr. D... Pamela's body felt numb. How could this be happening? She turned her head and realized Olivia Johnson was now standing mere feet from her. Olivia was moving towards Chris. Olivia smiled and reached over to hold Chris's hand. Pamela glared fiercely at Olivia. Confronted by Olivia's mocking smile, Pamela lost control and swung her fist toward her. Chris quickly stepped forward, pulling Olivia into his embrace and stepping back. Pamela missed her target and stumbled forward. Mr. Dickens reached out, grabbing the back of her collar. You dare to attack someone? You've really gone too far, come with me. Witnessing Pamela being forcibly taken away, Olivia burst into laughter. You're laughing? That lunatic almost hit you! Wendy exclaimed, still shaken. Luckily, I protected you, Chris smirked. What's wrong with Pamela suddenly losing control? Millie was puzzled. I'm pretty sure she just tried to give Chris a love letter and then gave it to Mr. Dickens instead. In front of so many people, too. It's no wonder she lost control. Olivia chuckled. Ah! Millie laughed along. Pamela is truly unlucky. Come on, let's go. Wendy waved her hand, still smiling. I'm hungry. You want to join us, Chris? Sure. Chris nodded. If Olivia was going, he would naturally join them. Olivia shot Chris a look. Chris, are you done hugging me? Can you let go now? <laughs> Chris chuckled softly, releasing his embrace. Let's go. <laughs> Olivia rolled her eyes at Chris and hurriedly grabbed Millie and Wendy. They had just reached the center of the field when they heard an announcement over the loudspeaker. Would Mr. Adam Reed please proceed to the office of the fifth floor director? Mr. Reed, please proceed to the office of the fifth floor director as soon as possible. Wonder what that's about? Wendy wondered aloud. I'm sure if it's important, we'll hear about it through the school gossip, Olivia said. In Mr. Dickens' office, an awkward, intense atmosphere hung in the air. Adam rushed over upon hearing the announcement. As he entered the room, he saw Pamela, head down with her back facing him. Adam asked, Mr. Dickens, what's the matter? Adam. Mr. Dickens looked at Adam and pointed at an envelope on the table. Come in and see what one of your homeroom students has done. Hmm? Adam walked over to the desk and picked up Pamela's letter. It was in a light blue envelope. Seeing that it was a love letter, Adam glanced at Pamela, who appeared pale. Mr. Dickens, this... Learning at this age should prioritize academics, not romance. Mr. Dickens scolded, frowning. She's also at that age. Adam sighed, trying to come to Pamela's defense, because he knew how strict Dickens was. I'll have a talk with her. Look at what she wrote! Mr. Dickens furrowed his brow. Open it and see what nonsense she's written. I'm so embarrassed. I don't think that's appropriate. Adam declined. This is Pamela's private matter. I don't recommend opening it. Hm. Mr. Dickens snorted. He was the intended recipient of the letter. He couldn't bring himself to be embarrassed. Regarding her punishment, I will inform the higher-ups and deal with it accordingly. Understood, Adam acknowledged. I know what to do. Mr. Dickens replied, You may take her with you. Yes, Adam said. He gestured for Pamela to follow him, and they left Mr. Dickens' office. 
Once they were outside, Adam looked at Pamela, who had her head lowered. Pam, what's going on? This kind of behavior isn't suitable. Adam, I... I made a mistake, Pamela stammered, her eyes filled with tears. I didn't know it would be like this. Adam sighed. I understand that you're growing up and experiencing new emotions, but as your teacher, I hope you focus on your studies first. Love can come later. Besides, it's not suitable to express it in such a public manner and for a teacher. I didn't mean to give that to him. It was for another kid, and I, I got so flustered. I'm sorry. Pamela apologized, wiping away her tears. I won't do something like this again. Remember your promise. Adam advised, patting Pamela's shoulder. I believe in your potential. Don't let this incident affect your studies. Focus on your future and make progress step by step. Yes, sir. Pamela nodded, her voice filled with determination. All right, let's go back to the classroom, Adam said, leading the way. Pamela followed behind Adam, her heart heavy with embarrassment and regret. She had never expected her bold actions to end up in such humiliation. From that moment on, she vowed to bury her feelings deep within and focus solely on her studies. The incident quickly spread throughout the school, becoming a topic of discussion among the students. Many couldn't help but laugh at Pamela's misfortune, while others felt sympathetic towards her. It served as a reminder to all students that love affairs were better kept private and not broadcasted in such a manner. Once Adam and Pamela left his office, Mr. Dickens let out a sigh and turned his attention to the mirror tucked in the corner of the wall to neaten his collar. After their departure from the office, Adam handed over the love letter to Pamela, uttering, I'll return this to you. Grimacing at the humiliating love letter, Pamela reluctantly accepted it. Holding the thin envelope in her hand, its weight felt burdening, like it was a boulder. Youth is still yours to embrace, so don't worry about such matters as unrequited love. You're an exceptional girl and college is brimming with good boys. Adam expressed sparingly, casting a glance at Pamela, who kept her gaze lowered. A deep sigh escaped his lips. Go home. Silently, Pamela turned around and made her way through the corridor until she reached a trash bin at the wall's corner. She paused, tearing the love letter into shreds, and tossing it inside as if seeking solace. Pamela lifted her leg and kicked the wall twice, only to feel a slight numbness in her toes. Then she pivoted and exited the school building. By this time, most of the students had already left, save for a few lingering figures on the sports field. As their eyes fell upon Pamela, whispers circulated, recounting the scene they had witnessed earlier. The weight of their gazes bore down on Pamela like an unwelcome spotlight. Embarrassment swiftly transformed into resentment, fueled by the memory of Olivia's scornful laughter. Pamela directed all her hatred towards Olivia, determined not to let her live a pleasant life. Straightening her posture, she acknowledged her momentary lapse in judgment, vowing not to give up. The author of her destiny was none other than herself. She aspired to become a better person, to ascend higher. Humans were forgetful creatures. Soon, nobody would recall the events of today. A few days could wash away many things. Even if someone remembered, once her grades were announced, she would represent Marshall High in the national competition for elite students, distancing herself from any lingering associations, and people would look up to her again. People like her only mocked those weaker than themselves. She longed to live a superior life, to find greater happiness than anyone else. At that point, only those who admired her from below would remain. Today's ordeal would ultimately become a fleeting entry in her life story, forgotten by all. Even if someone remembered, she would wield such power that no one would dare utter a word. Olivia, Pamela suddenly thought. Pamela gritted her teeth, vowing to ensure Olivia's miserable existence in this lifetime. On the day she triumphed over adversity, Olivia would be the first target of her vengeance. Achoo! Olivia suddenly felt an itch in her nose and sneezed. What's wrong? Millie shifted her gaze from the menu. Do you have a cold? Yes, just a mild one. 
Olivia rubbed her nose and replied, The temperature has dropped slightly these past few days. Indeed, Wendy nodded. It's quite peculiar. In previous years, we would have already had snow by now. The weather forecast only mentioned rain, not rain and snow. Olivia chimed in. Olivia, remember to order a cup of soup later to ward off the cold, Wendy reminded. Sure, Olivia nodded, glancing at Chris. Chris, what brings you here to a gathering of girls? Funny, Chris smiled. Wendy said, if it weren't for Chris protecting you today, you might have been attacked by that deranged Pamela. I wouldn't mind if she got a beating, Olivia mumbled. What did you say? Wendy couldn't hear clearly. Nothing, Olivia smiled. Have you finished looking at the menu? Once you're done, let me have a look. Sure, here you go. Wendy handed over the menu. Olivia took the menu, flipping through its pages. Beside her, Chris observed her profile, his gaze tinged with a hint of coldness. Wendy might not have heard Olivia's muttered words earlier, but Chris had caught them clearly. A flicker of concern arose within him. Engaging in such a reckless and perilous act like fighting Pamela in public couldn't possibly align with her values. Chris contemplated whether he should offer a warning or not. I'll have the soup, Olivia told the waiter, unaware of Chris's thoughts because she continued perusing the menu. And another large serving of Coke. That sounds good, Millie nodded. And what about Chris? Chris snapped out of his thoughts and glanced down at the menu. Nonchalantly, he placed his order. The club sandwich, please. All right. The waiter jotted down everyone else's dishes and departed. This place is truly delightful, Wendy remarked. I came here with my mother and godmother a couple of days ago. My mother and godmother were here too? Olivia tilted her head. Due to her tutoring schedules and studies, she hadn't visited Victoria and Desiree in a while. Yes, we thought of treating ourselves to some good food, Wendy explained with a smile. Wait a moment. What are you two talking about? I don't understand. Millie looked at Wendy and Olivia puzzled. What about your mother and godmother? Basically, my mother is her godmother, and her mother is my godmother, Wendy clarified. I see, Millie nodded. High society is truly a tangled web. Huh. The group burst into laughter. Then Wendy glanced out of the window. Oh, look, it's Francis. Invite him in. Olivia suggested. Wendy quickly hurried out of the restaurant. Chris, with a hint of dissatisfaction, questioned, Didn't you say it was a girls' gathering? Why did you invite him? Olivia could see Chris was wondering if she liked Francis. I wanted you to have a friend so you didn't feel so alone, Olivia retorted, rolling her eyes and smiling. A waiter promptly added another chair to the table, and once Francis had placed his order, the group engaged in conversation. What are you doing in the area, Francis? Wendy asked. Just going for a walk? Nah, there's a game shop nearby where you can play VR games, and I was planning to stop in and play a video game or buy one. Francis explained with a smile. I've been studying so diligently lately, so I could do well and bring my grades up for college, and there are a few good games I haven't indulged in for a month. You really love video games, don't you? Wendy sighed. That was like his whole personality, she thought. Yes, it's true love, Francis joked, making a heart gesture with his left hand over his chest. Have you ever thought about going into, like, video game development as a career one day? Olivia asked. Yep, game design, Francis replied. I'm really interested in game planning. I've loved games since I was a child. If given the chance, I don't think it would be a problem for me to personally plan and even successfully sell a game, no matter how old I am. Game design... Olivia murmured, suddenly intrigued by an idea. Francis, do you have any idea how much it costs to establish a video game company? It probably depends on the type of game, but I'm not entirely sure. Francis confessed, shaking his head. Why are you interested? A little, Olivia nodded. She remembered that the gaming industry had thrived in her previous life. She recalled reading news about a mobile game that earned hundreds of millions of dollars per week. What if we give it a try together? Francis felt a surge of excitement. We can start by developing a small game just for fun. There are numerous platforms available nowadays, 
and I hear about regular people starting apps out of their basements all of the time. That sounds very interesting, Wendy blinked. She seemed to want Francis to notice her. I play this game called Orange Light. It's really fascinating. I don't play online games, Millie shrugged. She was too focused on school. I don't play games either. Chris shook his head. He looked like he was trying to put Francis's hobby down. Liv, what kind of games do you like? Francis asked. Uh, Olivia realized that the only game she had played in her previous life was the one she had already shown Francis how to beat. Action games. Then shall we create an action game? Francis proposed. What about websites, clients, PS4, VR? Personally, I'm inclined towards VR games. It seemed like the most promising technological venture. Wendy clasped her hands together. I'm looking forward to it. Don't get too ahead of yourselves, Olivia cautioned, pouring cold water on their excitement. Let's look into how realistic this is first. We've still got high school to deal with, she joked, and I have a revenge list to get back to, she thought. But I've been so distracted. She hadn't realized when she first got back how much her daily life would get in the way of what she thought was once a simple mission, to take things back and hurt those who had wronged her so she could get rid of them. That's true, Francis conceded, his shoulders drooping slightly. From what I know, the production cost of League of Legends is $18 million, and that's just for a client-based game. $18 million? Wendy's eyes widened. That number was beyond her wildest dreams. When the time comes, why don't you present me with a detailed plan of what you want to do? And if it looks good, maybe you and I go in on it together with our parents' investment help. Olivia suggested, maintaining her optimism. She liked the idea of making her father proud with an entrepreneurial opportunity. Sure, Francis agreed. The thought of playing games and realizing his dreams with Olivia filled him with a surge of passion, as if his body was brimming with boundless energy. After a while, the waiters served them their dishes. As they indulged in conversation, they relished their meal with evident delight. After their meal, they each returned home. Chris had originally intended to have a private conversation with Olivia, but noticing her preoccupied demeanor, he chose not to say anything and merely said goodbye. Upon arriving home, Olivia could hear the laughter of her grandfather and Michael, even before entering the front door. As she turned her head, she noticed several unfamiliar cars parked in the courtyard. Wondering if they had guests, Olivia thought, could there be some visitors? How long will you be staying this time? She heard her father, Michael, ask someone. We can be here for a while. The man's voice emanated calmly, his speech unhurried yet comforting. It's good to see you again. As soon as she entered her family's mansion, Olivia stood in shock at the doorway. Could it be the return of my uncle Bruno and my half-brother Edward? She approached fixing her gaze upon the two strangers seated on the sofa. The elder gentleman bore a remarkable resemblance to Michael in both age and facial features. However, he appeared younger than the man Olivia had glimpsed in the gourmet magazines. Clad in a casual suit, he exuded an air of relaxed amiability. Seated next to Bruno was a young man who could only be Edward, her junior by a few years. His features were still in the process of maturing, yet he possessed a striking handsomeness. A faint trace of Rachel lingered in his countenance too. Michael caught sight of Olivia's entrance and greeted her with a smile. Liv, you're back. Come quickly, greet your uncle and brother. Bruno and Chase, I mean Edward. Michael smiled. I keep forgetting Chase goes by Edward now. Olivia nodded politely. Edward's full name was Edward Chase Johnson. And before he left for Europe to study and learn about cooking from his uncle, he used to go by Chase. Now, though, he clearly dressed more formally and carried himself like a serious man, so he chose to go by Edward. Chase sounds like a child's name, Olivia heard Edward thinking. He carried himself like he was much older than 14. With a smile adorning her face, Olivia approached them and greeted. Hello, Uncle Bruno. Hello, Edward. Bruno fixed his gaze upon Olivia, his eyes unwavering. Is this Victoria's daughter? 
Rachel's eyes sparkled upon hearing Bruno's words, a faint grimace gracing her lips. Uncanny, Bruno affirmed, a smile playing on his lips. He often found himself reminiscing about Victoria as he beheld Olivia. Olivia maintained a composed expression, though her heart stirred. She refused to feel inferior or out of her place within the Johnson family. Though from reading Rachel's thoughts, Liv was well aware that Rachel had summoned Bruno and Edward to do just that. How old are you now? Bruno inquired. Seventeen years old. Olivia responded with a smile. Bruno appeared momentarily lost in thought. Time passes so swiftly. Seventeen years have elapsed since I last saw Victoria. Even now, I cannot fathom her actions back then. Grandpa Jack interjected, his tone implying a desire to avoid delving into such matters right now. Let us not dwell on the past. You're right, Bruno concurred, his smile persisting. My mistake. Come, follow me. Jack's countenance eased slightly. Now that everyone is back, we can have the kitchen prepare a meal. We should all meet in the dining room once your things are put away. Ladies, help them with their things. Yes, sir. The housekeepers attending to the new arrivals promptly responded before departing for the kitchen and the guest bedrooms. Wow, Monica rolled her eyes at Olivia. Could you have been any later getting home today? We've all been waiting for you to eat. Olivia scrunched her nose. She couldn't tell her family that she had already eaten, especially now that she knew they had been waiting for her. But she had clearly informed them of her plans to eat with friends earlier. She had even called and let one of the maids know she wouldn't be home for dinner. Damn it, she thought. It seemed that maid who answered my call must have told Rachel my plans, and Rachel didn't bother to tell my dad. Classic Rachel, always trying to make me look bad. Come on, everyone, let's eat. Jack called out from the dining room impatiently. Soon everyone congregated together in the dining room. Olivia removed her school bag and handed it to the maid before joining the group. As she approached the dining table, she noticed that the seats were already occupied, and Edward had taken her place. The scene carried a bitter irony. Concealing her disappointment, Olivia subtly curled her lips so she looked completely unfazed. I'm famished, Bruno complained with a smile. The food on the plane today was abysmal, barely fit for human consumption. You've always been fastidious with your words since childhood. Jack remarked with a half-sigh, half-relief. Today, I am eager to savor the culinary skills of the chefs in this house. These dishes are all my favorites. Bruno gazed at the array of delicacies adorning the table, a smile gracing his face. Truly, there is no place like home. Liv, why are you still standing? Michael, seemingly the only one concerned about her predicament, was the first to notice. Does someone bring a chair for my eldest daughter? Certainly, the maid promptly responded. It's entirely my fault, Bruno said with a frown, starting to stand up. Edward and I haven't returned for so many years, and yet we managed to cause trouble for the family the moment we come back. Michael smiled and reassured him. What are you saying? You didn't do anything. Relax and stay where you are. But that means Liv won't have a seat. Bruno looked at Olivia and said, Don't hold it against your uncle. Olivia, hearing Bruno's words, momentarily hesitated before raising her eyes, appearing startled, and meeting Jack's stern gaze. As expected, she encountered a pair of slightly displeased eyes, yet when those eyes detected Olivia's panic, the disapproving expression faded, and he uttered a single sentence. A child has no reason to hate or not to hate, she won't hold anything against you, Jack said. I was merely jesting, Dad, Bruno interjected, his smile directed at Olivia. However, his smile failed to reach the depths of his eyes, which harbored a chilling glint. Olivia, well aware of the blatant provocation, chose to accept it with a gracious smile as she took another seat further down the table, away from her father. She knew Rachel had intentionally arranged for this to happen. I hope the jet lag isn't too bad, Rachel told her brother-in-law. Bruno's eyes lit up as he looked at Olivia, offering a smile. Not too difficult at all. Returning to one's home can never be arduous, no matter the distance or time or jet lag. It's always worth it. 
This Olivia is certainly a captivating individual, he thought, watching her. The resemblance to Victoria was striking. But I'm not as nice as my mother, Olivia thought. Besides Olivia, as she looked at her uncle, her half-brother Edward cast her a glance filled with disgust. Olivia discreetly observed his thoughts as she watched him from the corner of her eye, too. Interloper, Edward thought. You'll be out of here soon. With a smile on her face, she partook in the meal, though she had already eaten dinner earlier and had little appetite remaining. She took only a few bites before ceasing her consumption. Michael inquired, Is the food to your liking? It's barely passable. Bruno frowned, patting Michael on the shoulder. Brother, you see, no matter how delicious the food may be, it won't taste good to me. Every dish that enters my mouth automatically becomes an ingrained cooking procedure in my subconscious. It's an occupational hazard, something that cannot be changed in this lifetime. Laughter resonated around the table in response. Is learning from the best chefs in the world fun? Monica asked eagerly, her spirits high. I can imagine it is. As its moments... Bruno's eyes lit up. There's a certain thrill in surpassing your peers and leaving them in the dust. Otherwise, it wouldn't be as enjoyable. As Bruno spoke, Edward froze. It's not the same as before, Jack sighed, shaking his head helplessly. Loyalty is a scarce virtue these days. Back in my day, people remained true to their families. In times of trouble, they stood united. When mistakes were made, they collectively bore the consequences. But nowadays, people seem to revel in the misfortune and punishment of others. Well, I can't speak to that, but I'm just focused on taking good care of Edward. Bruno smiled. How is Monica's culinary prowess? Rachel smiled and shook her head. She only possesses basic skills. Monica chuckled, playfully sticking out her tongue. And how about you, Liv? You a big cook? Bruno inquired, turning his attention to Olivia once more. I know how to prepare a few home-cooked dishes, Olivia replied. I see. Bruno nodded thoughtfully. Well, I plan to take on another disciple next year. It would be advantageous if he were to select someone from our family, you know. Really? Monica's eyes sparkled, her excitement for life in Europe evident. Above all, she yearned to become a master chef's disciple and bask in the world's admiration. Indeed. Bruno smiled, shifting his gaze between Monica and Olivia. His restaurant empire was expanding rapidly, and he was always looking to find additional helpers he could trust, who would maybe one day take over. Originally, he hadn't intended to recruit from the Johnson family, but now that he pondered it, it didn't seem like a bad idea. If Monica were chosen, Rachel could finally relax, free from concerns about Olivia outshining Monica. If he selected Olivia, she would undoubtedly have to leave the mansion, and Olivia's scheming nature, which Rachel gossiped to him about, could potentially prove beneficial to him. Once she departed, he would find a way to keep her in Europe, assisting him there. Similar to Edward, she would return home every few years, then Rachel needn't worry about her causing any upheaval. Moreover, he bore a 17-year-old debt to Victoria. It would be disingenuous to claim that he harbored no guilt, Yet in recent years, he had grown increasingly indifferent. Such was life. One had to be ruthless to secure a better future. Are the two of them capable? Michael smiled, waving his hand dismissively. They're so young and focused on school in the States. They haven't been training alongside you for a while as Edward has. It's best not to have high expectations. Dad? Monica protested, her tone a mix of coquettishness and irritation. What if I want to be with my brother in Paris? Edward felt a twinge of discomfort upon hearing Monica's words. He still struggled to adapt his newfound surroundings. Having left home at a young age, years of separation had eroded any semblance of familial affection. Olivia remained silent, merely observing the expressions of those around her. She had no interest in becoming her uncle's disciple, let alone leaving New York City at this time. Her aspirations lay in collaborating with Francis to establish a game company at the moment, and to pain back Rachel and Pamela, and everyone else who caused her pain. If you're willing, I'll personally teach you how to cook this week, Bruno nodded, stating. Once I depart, 
All of you can diligently follow the methods I teach you to train. With that, you'll have a higher chance of being chosen to come train with me in Europe, if you'd like. Is that truly possible? Monica's eyes sparkled, brimming with an anticipation for a life in Paris. Of course, her greatest desire was to become so talented and world-renowned in something and have Olivia grovel at her feet. Absolutely, Bruno smiled. He might as well choose one of his nieces or nephews as the heir to his empire one day. Great, Monica exclaimed, her small fist raised, her excitement palpable. Bruno turned his gaze to Olivia. What do you think? Would you be interested in being one of my mentees too? Thank you for your kind offer, Uncle, Olivia smiled. However, I need to focus on my studies this year, for colleges. That's truly a shame, Bruno sighed, smiling wistfully. Truthfully, he held greater optimism for Olivia than Monica. She seemed more resourceful and less emotional, based on what Rachel had told him. Everyone harbors their own ambitions, Jack remarked, observing Olivia. Uncle Bruno, when can we begin my culinary education? Monica inquired curiously. Oh, so eager, Bruno chuckled. Just remember not to complain about it being boring and tiresome when the time comes. No, I would never. Monica firmly shook her head, her energy unabated. Laughter resonated around the table, though Rachel's laughter was tinged with worry. Her heart wrestled with conflicting emotions. If Monica were chosen to be Bruno's mentee alongside Edward, it would undoubtedly pave the way for a successful future. However, it would necessitate her departure from New York City and the Johnson Mansion, and the security both offered. Could Monica, so pure and innocent, truly handle a life abroad without her mother? While it presented a valuable opportunity for growth as a mother, Rachel found it difficult to part with her little girl. She could be ruthless toward herself and the world, but her true love resided solely in Michael and Monica. She couldn't bear to let them go. But she trusted Bruno implicitly. Even if everyone else betrayed her, she believed he would never do so. Monica regarded Olivia with a smug smile, tilting her chin defiantly. Her eyes brimmed with provocation, while her smile exuded arrogance. Olivia chose to ignore the display, simply remarking, I am full and have to get to my homework. May I please be excused? All right, off you go, Michael nodded. Just don't study too late. Once Olivia was out of the room, Bruno remarked, What a diligent child. After observing the father-daughter interaction, his gaze then shifted to the jealousy present in Rachel's eyes, which were dark with envy. She hated competing with Olivia for her husband's attention. Olivia lay on the bed in her room, gazing out the window. It was clear that Bruno was singling her out in some way and that Edward strongly disliked her. Having no recollection of them from her past life, she lacked confidence in handling the situation. Bruno, in particular, presented a facade of friendliness and cheerfulness, but beneath it all, he possessed an unwavering determination to do something bad to her. She just didn't know what yet. As for Edward, he seemed out of sync with the family in general, treating neither the Johnson mansion nor Rachel and Monica as his own. There was no interaction between him and his mother or sister, not even a glance throughout the entire dinner. It didn't seem like something a mother would do. Is Edward truly Rachel's child? Olivia harbored doubts. The more she pondered, the more perplexed she became. Her thoughts were interrupted by the ringing of her phone. Sitting up, she retrieved her phone from her school bag and answered, Hello? What are you up to? Chris asked immediately. You again. Olivia, her mind in disarray, responded half-teasingly. What do you want? I thought we could take a stroll. Do you have time? Chris Jones, not everyone has as much free time as you do. Olivia chuckled. I still have studying to do. Didn't we just take all our exams at the end of last semester? Chris frowned. Yeah, but Vera started tutoring me for the second semester. I need to study in advance because she wants to go over some stuff tomorrow, Olivia explained. In that case, if she doesn't come tutor you tomorrow, 
Can you come out and hang out tonight? Chris asked. Olivia was taken aback. Chris had a habit of pulling strings to get whatever he wanted. Fine, you can come by, Olivia sighed. She was feeling quite vexed at the moment, and a breath of fresh air might do her some good anyway, she figured. Then make your way downstairs, I'm heading in now, Chris replied. Ugh, Olivia was surprised. So you were already here? Don't worry, I wasn't here long, Chris smiled. Just arrived. Olivia rolled her eyes. I'll come downstairs now. After hanging up, she opened up her closet and retrieved a warm coat. The temperature outside had dropped significantly, chilling her to the bone. Once downstairs, she found Chris already waiting in the living room. The other members of the Johnson family had finished their meal, with only Jack and Edward retiring upstairs to rest. The others remained seated on the sofa, engaged in conversation. As Olivia appeared, Monica's eyes filled with jealousy and anger. What was the meaning of this? Why was Olivia parading her fiancé around like this, taunting Monica? Hadn't they done enough to her? Must she resort to bringing men over so brazenly? How shameless. Ah, hello, Chris. This is Liv's uncle. Michael pointed at Bruno and introduced him. Hello, Bruno smiled, looking at Chris. No wonder he hadn't heard from the Jones family recently. Chris Jones had been hiding in New York, and his parents were jet-setting between here and London. Hello, Chris responded. He felt a sense of familiarity when he looked at Bruno, but couldn't recall where he had seen him before. Chris, my uncle is a world-renowned chef, Monica proudly announced, and my brother will be one day too. Uncle Bruno learned under Chef Franco Alva. Oh, a hint of displeasure flickered in Chris's eyes upon hearing this. He detested everything related to Franco. He glanced towards the doorway and spotted Olivia approaching it, prompting him to stand up before he could say more on the subject. We should, uh, head out, maybe? Liv? Michael wore a complex expression as he reminded her to come back early. Yes. Olivia nodded. Yes, father. She followed Chris out of the Johnson mansion. Observing their departure, Monica rolled her eyes and muttered, It's so late and she's still going out how shameless. Monica? Rachel interjected, trying to shush her daughter. Monica failed to grasp the situation clearly. Michael was already anxious, and her words would only compound his worries. Comprehending Rachel's intention, Bruno's hand tightened around the teacup for a moment before he forced a smile and said, I recall Liv being engaged to the Chris boy, right? Yes, Michael nodded. I believe Chris is an intelligent individual. He's quite remarkable, Bruno remarked. It would be Liv's good fortune to marry into the Chris family. That is, if Chris can survive until then, he thought. He knew much more about Chris from Chef Franco, but didn't say anything to his brother just yet. There would be a time for that later. What fortune? Michael smiled, shaking his head. As long as she is happy. Ha ah, ah. ha! Bruno smiled and chose not to continue the conversation. He looked at Monica and said, Come to the kitchen tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. I will teach you how to cook an omelet. Really? Monica was taken aback, her excitement evident. That's wonderful. Thank you, Uncle. I'll learn diligently. Rest well tonight, Bruno advised. Tomorrow will be quite demanding. I'm not afraid of hard work, Monica affirmed. Very well. I'm going to my room to rest. Bruno stood up. Good night. Have a good rest. Michael patted his shoulder. Bruno turned and left the living room, a smile etched on his face. Honey, I'm going to check on Edward, Rachel informed him. Rachel rose from her seat but didn't head towards Edward's door. Instead, she knocked on Bruno's door. As the door opened, Rachel was pulled into the room by Bruno. Rachel, I... Thank you for coming back this time. Rachel withdrew her wrist from Bruno's grasp. I'm also grateful that you're willing to teach Monica how to cook. Witnessing Rachel's icy demeanor, which kept people at arm's length, Bruno felt a pang in his heart. He gazed into Rachel's eyes and could only offer a forced laugh. It's my duty to help my family naturally. If you need anything, just let me or your brother know. Yes, 
Runo's throat tightened. And thank you for taking good care of Edward. Rachel lowered her head, her guilt towards her son palpable. She had neglected her responsibilities as a mother, perhaps favoring Monica, the child who had grown up beside her. Again, it's my duty, Bruno responded. Rachel glanced at Bruno, realizing that there was maybe more to be said, though she was not ready to say it. She could only offer a smile. Then sleep well. All right, Bruno replied. As Rachel walked past him, towards the door, he reached out and grabbed her wrist once again. Let go, Rachel stated firmly, her voice carrying a depth of emotion. Rachel! Bruno gazed at her as she stepped back, his mind drifting back 17 years. A bitter smile played on his lips. You haven't changed a bit. How could I change, living the same life day after day? Rachel laughed self-deprecatingly. She could only do this for a man she loved, even if he didn't love her. Do you regret it? Bruno asked, his voice trailing off. If he doesn't regret it, Rachel interrupted Bruno's words, snatching her wrist from his grasp. Without turning back, she closed Bruno's door behind her. As she did, her eyes flickered with a hint of something. Regret? No, she didn't regret what she had done. Why should she? She had emerged victorious, attaining the man she desired in the position she deserved. There was no room for regret. Bruno stood before the closed door, wearing a bitter smile. He should have known this would happen long ago, shouldn't he? He too had grown older, no longer the young boy he was 17 years ago. Back then, he had been infatuated with Rachel, and that infatuation had led him to do things he shouldn't have. And now, he felt that those actions were precisely what he should have done. For when he saw Rachel again, his heart still fluttered, gazing in the mirror at the marks left by time on his face. Bruno suddenly burst into laughter. He was no longer young indeed. New York City was a bustling and vibrant city, especially at night. Cars zoomed past, neon lights illuminated towering buildings, street music filled the air, couples strolled hand in hand, and both tipsy office workers and cheerful employees traversed the streets. The scene exuded the city's energy and the pressure it imposed. Everyone played their part, like small figures spinning atop an octagonal box, busy and spinning, unaware of when it would all come to an end. Olivia stood by the roadside, her hands in her pockets, observing the passerby. She took a deep breath. She was prone to overthinking, but lately she had been too preoccupied to indulge in such thoughts. Today, being invited out by Chris gave her an excuse and an opportunity to take a moment to breathe. Here. Chris returned to Olivia's side, holding two cups of hot chocolate he bought from a street vendor. He glanced at the young man who had been about to approach Olivia, his gaze enough to make the guy awkwardly rub his nose and retreat. Thank you. Olivia reached out and accepted the hot chocolate with both hands, feeling the warmth seep into her palms and fingertips. Of course. Chris looked at Olivia. Shall we walk? All right. Olivia took a sip of hot chocolate and nodded. The two of them strolled shoulder to shoulder on the street, no words passing between them. They walked in comfortable silence. After a while, Olivia had finished half of her drink, so she broke the silence and asked, Did you ask me to come out because you have something to tell me? Yes, Chris replied. You intentionally provoked that, Ah, uh, oh, what's her name again? Pamela, Olivia answered. Yes, I did it on purpose. You wanted her to hit you? Chris's expression darkened. Yes, Olivia nodded. Have you considered that you might get hurt? Chris appeared displeased. How could I get hurt by a girl like her? Olivia found it amusing, taking another big sip of her hot chocolate. It was at risk of getting cold, so she drank it quickly. Is it worth it? Chris furrowed his brows. Yes, she's been rude to me, so why not? Olivia affirmed, taking another gulp. She believed it was worth it to provoke Pamela because she knew how powerful she herself was. Olivia wanted to get Pamela suspended and make her miserable, maybe even get her expelled, make her lose everything, then she'd kill her. Just like Pamela had slowly destroyed Olivia in her last life, but she didn't tell Chris all of this, not yet. 
It's not worth it. Chris clearly wasn't pleased with Olivia's response. He tossed the empty cup into a nearby trash bin and grabbed Olivia's arms with both hands, making her face him directly. You must never put yourself at risk or harm others for the sake of the past. It's the most foolish thing you could do, do you understand? What if she didn't just hit you? What if Pamela had a knife or something? He didn't want Olivia to take such risks. Olivia stared straight into Chris's eyes, holding. After taking a final sip of hot chocolate, she inhaled twice. Then she parted her lips and asked, Are you saying that I shouldn't plot against others? Well, my main point, Chris clarified, is you mustn't harm yourself. Oh, Olivia nodded. I understand. She comprehended Chris's concern. As a friend, he worried for her. Do you truly understand? Chris wondered, finding Olivia's response puzzling. I really do. Olivia nodded again. I know you're concerned for my safety. It's good that you know. Don't do such things again in the future. Chris released his grip. Please. I know, I know. Olivia shrugged her shoulders. To achieve her goals, she would have to make sacrifices. But she would act within her capabilities. And she wouldn't do anything in front of Chris if she could help it. Ah! Olivia looked up at the sky. It's snowing. It was the first snowfall of the year. They had discussed the possibility of it snowing earlier that day. Olivia reached out, attempting to catch the glistening snowflakes, feeling their cold touch on her warm palm. The snowflakes melted quickly. Observing this, she pulled her hand back into her sleeve and tried to catch the snowflakes again. They landed on her sleeve and with a smile on her face, Olivia extended her sleeve toward Chris. Look, snow! Seeing her smile, the worry in Chris's heart dissipated instantly, and he couldn't be overly concerned anymore seeing her this elated. He could only sigh helplessly. Yes, snow. Snowflakes fell gently, captivating the people on the street. Some reached out to catch them, while others quickened their pace or raised their umbrellas. It looks like the snowfall's getting heavier, Olivia observed, gazing at the sky. It's a good sign of a snowy season. Yep, Chris agreed. Are you feeling cold? Not at all, Olivia shook her head, extending her sleeve to catch the snowflakes. Look, these two snowflakes are completely different. Chris, not in the mood to examine snowflakes, placed a hat from Olivia's coat on her head. Don't catch a cold. Fine, Dad, Olivia teased. Chris, has it been snowing in London for a long time? Yes, I heard it snowed about a half a month ago, Chris replied. Do you like snow? Yes, Olivia nodded. I love winter. How about you? I prefer autumn, Chris reveled. Hmm, the season of the harvest, Olivia acknowledged. Do you prefer fallen leaves or fruits? Neither. Chris responded. Winter is too cold, summer is too hot, and spring winds are strong. Only autumn remains. Olivia suddenly felt foolish for asking Chris such questions. As long as you're happy, I guess. Really? Chris smiled, reaching out to hold Olivia's waist. As long as I'm happy? Hmm? Olivia was taken aback and immediately thought of the day at the amusement park. She tried to step back, but her waist was firmly held in place. She knew she liked him, but she wasn't sure how to act on it. She was nervous that if she gave in to her desires and kissed Chris openly, she would get too attracted to him emotionally and develop real feelings. And what if that got in the way of her mission in this new second chance at life? She couldn't get distracted simply because of a crush. Observing the uncertainty in Olivia's eyes, Chris smiled and leaned closer, intending to kiss her forehead. Her expression was simply too adorable. Stop fooling around, Olivia attempted to dodge, feeling flustered and embarrassed. At that moment, someone else grabbed her hand and pulled her away from Chris's grasp. Witnessing his fiance being whisked away, Chris instinctively reached for Olivia's other hand. Regaining her balance, Olivia looked at the person who had pulled her. Jeremy? Hi, Jeremy said. He himself didn't quite understand why he pulled her. He was simply passing by 
intending to keep his head down and continue walking. But when he saw Chris about to kiss Olivia, and she appeared nervous but unable to avoid it, his body moved on its own accord. By the time he realized what he was doing, he had already pulled Olivia away. Chris glanced at Jeremy, a faint smile forming on his lips. He suspected that Olivia's classmate had ulterior motives. What a coincidence seeing you here. It certainly seems that way, Jeremy responded. Isn't it too much of a coincidence, though? Chris questioned. Indeed, Jeremy met Chris's gaze. Where are you heading out so late at night? Chris scrutinized Jeremy and noticed that the collar of his ordinary down jacket was peeking out. It was evident that he had recently done something or just finished a task. Chris found himself somewhat intrigued by Jeremy. I was feeling hungry, so I stepped out for a late night snack. Jeremy, aware of Chris's gaze, turned slightly and used his left hand to zip up his jacket. He had just finished a task and wore the down jacket for an easier escape. What about you, Chris? What brings you out so late? Can't you tell? We're on a date, Chris stated, raising his chin arrogantly. If the two of you have something to discuss, you could both let go of my hands, Olivia interjected, feeling helpless as the two men conversed happily while holding on to her. Did they really need to involve her in their conversation? Moreover, their posture was becoming quite awkward, obstructing the pedestrians trying to pass by. Only then did the two men realize that they were both still holding Olivia's hand. Jeremy instinctively let go, apologizing. Sorry. It's all right. Olivia shook her head, feeling grateful to Jeremy for at least listening to her. She turned to Chris, rolling her eyes. He didn't let go of her hand. Do I need to go over the rules of our agreement? She wondered. I'm only his fiance in name. The constant public displays of affection were a bit much, though. I won't bother you any longer, Jeremy remarked, not meeting their eyes. He still had work to attend to at home. No worries, Olivia reassured him. See you at school. Jeremy felt a hint of disappointment at Olivia's farewell. Unlike during school days when he could gaze at her every day, he hated parting ways with her outside of school. A sense of emptiness lingered in his heart, and he nodded awkwardly. Hmm, see you then. Goodbye, deskmate. Chris teased Jeremy. Jeremy glanced at Chris and bid farewell. Goodbye. He turned and walked away. Don't get distracted by your feelings, he told himself once he was far away from Olivia and Chris. There was still something significant he had to accomplish. San Francisco was in a state of unrest, with different political forces and gangs vying for control. If he could seize an opportunity he had been working towards in the second half of the year... It would greatly aid his plans. This time, failure was not an option. He had invested everything into it, and his loved ones were still awaiting his return back home. Your deskmate is quite peculiar, Chris remarked, watching Jeremy's departure and recalling the information Sven had uncovered about Jeremy. He didn't expect members of the Spencer family to be so restless as well. It seemed that the time had come for a reshuffling of the seven major families in Manhattan. Narrowing his eyes, Chris contemplated the reorganization. After all, if he were to confront Franco one day, the support of the seven major families would be indispensable. It's not your fault, Olivia retorted, rolling her eyes at Chris. Also, Chris, I've said before, I'm only your fiancé on paper. I hope you won't do anything further. Before she could finish her sentence, Chris took hold of her hand. Let's go. I'm hungry. Come have a bite with me. What? Olivia felt a wave of nausea at the thought of eating. She had already had dinner twice today. I don't want to eat. I'd rather go home. Accompany me for a meal. Chris smiled. I'll take you home afterward. Huh? Olivia furrowed her brows. Taking back her hand, Chris led Olivia in the opposite direction of Jeremy. In the alley they passed, a black Bentley was parked. The window began to rise and Devin, sitting in the front passenger seat, put away his binoculars. Albert, she spoke, stowing away her binoculars. Didn't you say Jeremy was working? I saw him try to steal a girl from another guy, but he failed. Miss, I'm more curious about where you acquired those binoculars. Albert began. That's not important. Devin squinted her eyes. 
Her brother was too weak. It was clearly time for her to make a move. When Chris escorted Olivia back to the Johnson mansion, it was already half past ten. Michael had been sitting on the sofa, sipping tea and anxiously awaiting Olivia's return. When he saw her safe and sound, relief washed over him. After a brief conversation with Olivia and Chris, Michael retired upstairs. Your dad cares about you a lot, Chris whispered. What? Olivia asked. Like any ordinary father waiting for his daughter to get home from a date? Chris explained with a smile. Isn't that just caring? Uh, Olivia was momentarily speechless. Yeah, I guess. The thought made her smile. What a difference from her last life. Well, you should get some sleep. I'll take my leave, Chris said, reaching out to ruffle Olivia's hair. Hey, stop that. Olivia swatted away Chris's hand and advised, You do. Get home safe. Will do. Oh, and I'll be busy tomorrow, Chris replied, so I may not have much time to hang out with you. I don't need you to hang out with me, Olivia smiled. You make it sound like I have nothing else to do. Chris chuckled, pondering for a moment. Touché. Well, regarding your game project with Francis, if you need money, just let me know. I'm always happy to invest in worthwhile ventures. Thank you. Olivia raised the corner of her mouth and nodded. I appreciate it. It's the least I can do, he said, taking Olivia's hand and lightly kissing it. Olivia awkwardly withdrew her hand. Chris, that's what I wanted to talk to you about. You see, she shivered and glanced around before stepping closer to Chris. She whispered in a hushed voice only so they could hear. Although we're engaged, we both know it's just an agreement, and it will become meaningless after five years, so can you please refrain from kissing me all the time, even if it's just out of courtesy? She was concerned that Rachel's people in the mansion might still be awake. The walls had ears, and Olivia spoke softly, standing close to Chris. Seemingly displeased with Olivia's thoughts about the agreement, Chris reached out and wrapped his arm around Olivia's waist, drawing her closer into an embrace. Anger flickered in Olivia's eyes. Don't you understand English? If Chris continued like this, she would have to reconsider whether she wanted to continue with their deal. There's something in the left corner, Chris whispered, lowering his head and rubbing his cheek against Olivia's ear. Don't move. Hearing Chris's voice, Olivia froze, not making any sudden movements. She asked, Who is it? Gazing at the corner, Chris murmured softly, I don't know. They've just snuck back out. Reluctantly, he released his tight embrace, letting go of her hand and taking a step back. I'm leaving. Yes, take care, Olivia responded, waving her hand. Her mind remained fixated on the corner. She didn't know who it was, and she wasn't sure if they were still there. Good night, Chris said, his gaze lingering on Olivia before turning around and departing from the Johnson's mansion. He feared it would be some time before he saw this wildcat burying her fangs and claws again, because he knew he had a lot of work he had to do. He would miss her. After Chris left, Olivia slowly turned around, casting a glance toward the empty corner behind her. Seeing only the faint glow of a light, Olivia furrowed her brow. Rachel's people still possess some skill. They had departed without making a sound, but she would eventually catch that person. Yawning, Olivia ascended the stairs to her room. Vera would be coming tomorrow morning to give her supplementary lessons. In the afternoon, she planned to visit Victoria. She had informed Michael earlier that she would spend one night at Victoria's place every Saturday and return on Sunday night, so she could help Olivia prepare for the elite student competition. Michael had agreed to her plans. After taking a shower, Olivia prepared to go to bed. However, just before she turned off the lights, her phone rang. Who could it be? Olivia muttered. It's almost midnight. She picked up the phone, which was charging on the nightstand. Glancing at the caller ID, Olivia answered the call. Francis, do you know what time it is? Liv? Francis' voice sounded somewhat low. We might not be able to make the VR game. Oh? Olivia asked. I checked today. To create the game I want, the production budget would be close to, like, $17 million. Francis lamented, sounding a bit frustrated. I can't come up with that much money. In that case, we won't pursue that option. 
Olivia said. If we can't bite off more than we can chew, maybe we could just conduct thorough market research, covering all types of games in the market. See if there's something cheaper we could come up with. Can you do that? Yes, Francis responded confidently. He had always been knowledgeable about games. Half a month should be enough. Cool. Oh, and before you collected game information from a player's perspective, now I want you to gather it from a planner's perspective. Explore everything you can find, game types, target audiences, and operation modes. I want you to conduct a scientific analysis to determine which game types are most popular and why. Olivia instructed. Now get some sleep. Don't stay up too late. Okay. Francis replied. Good night. After hanging up the phone, Olivia yawned, plugged in her phone, and settled back into bed. She quickly drifted off to sleep. However, when she woke, it felt as though she hadn't slept at all throughout the night. The following morning, Monica, dressed neatly in a plaid skirt and a button-up Oxford shirt, sat at the dining table, eagerly awaiting Bruno to teach her cooking. The appointed time was from 8 o'clock to 9 o'clock, and then extended to 9.30. Monica who had initially been full of energy, now appeared a little dispirited. She rested her head on the table, her eyes fixated on the clock ticking toward her, growing increasingly impatient and anxious. When she heard footsteps, her face lit up until she realized the footsteps belonged to Olivia, who came downstairs fully dressed. Monica rolled her eyes and sat up straight. Oh, it's you. Morning to you too. Olivia looked at Monica. Ugh. Monica glanced at the clock. It was already 9.45, so why hadn't Uncle Bruno come down yet? 